and welcome to Christie's. My name is Sarah Mao, Director of Christie's Education Asia Pacific and your MC and moderator this morning. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to Christie's first Art and Sustainability Forum in Asia from Hong Kong. This forum is also being live streamed to several online platforms including Christie's Asia Facebook, Christie's YouTube and Christie's.com. Simultaneous interpretation to Mandarin will be provided on Christie's WeChat channel, Zaiyi and BTV. To those joining us online, a very warm welcome to you too. We are delighted to welcome some truly inspiring voices in their respective industries to share their thoughts on sustainability this morning. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Klomps, Director at Zaha Hadid Architects, Johnny Yu, <laughs> Advisor to Chairman and Head of Sustainability at Henderson's Land Development Company, Damien Tang, Chief Sustainability Officer at UniSeal Global Limited. <laughs> Veronica Castillo, Deputy Director of Collections and Exhibitions at M Plus. <laughs> Betty Ng, Founder and Director at Collective. <laughs> and Francis Bilan, President of Christie's Asia Pacific. <laughs> and now I'd like to invite Francis on stage for the opening remarks. Francis, please. Good morning uh, to all of you. Thank you so much for being here today, taking the time to, uh, to join us in person or online. As, um, as Sarah was explaining, there's, there's quite a few opportunities to join us through uh, Facebook, IG, uh, or multiple platform in, uh, in China. Um, I'm particularly excited, actually, to host this uh, Art and Sustainability Forum, which, which actually, I believe, is not just the first one in Asia. I think it's the first one that we at Christie's do. Uh, and why do we do this? Um, 
you join us here at the convention center, you see there's all these uh, fantastic objects um, being lined up. Some of them already have found buyers. We have 15 live auctions, six online auctions running. But we believe at Christie's that um, Christie's is more than selling art or luxury. We believe that uh, in our leadership role in the industry, we have a duty. Uh, we have a duty to live according to values that are very dear to us, that are very dear to our shareholder. Uh, and sustainability is one of them. It's not the only one of them. Uh, we've been across the year very active when it comes to uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, some of our team have participated in the, the gay games a few days ago here in Hong Kong. Uh, we had a, a, a system of, uh, we give money to students, we call it Heart for Art, uh, to actually help them study um, uh, art history. Uh, we, we, we take pride in diversity in the workplace. Uh, we have, um, I think, the, the highest ratio of female auctioneer that uh, you can see in the industry, but that's something that we leave this value day, you know, daily in the way we operate and in the way we run uh, the company. Uh, we have multiple philanthropic initiatives. I'm sure some of you have uh, attended gala dinners where our auctioneers are coming to support charitable uh, causes. We, uh, we also ourselves sometimes uh, get a lot into ourselves that actually are here are being sold for foundation. We had a watch yesterday from the Dufour Foundation um, and the proceeds were going to their charity and part of the buyer's premium as well. Um, and we take pride generally as a, a very important player in the art world to be, to be at the forefront for our values, but be at the forefront to initiate discussions and to inspire. We've been hosting uh, so far seven art and tech summits. Um, the last one was in uh, New York. We had one here in Hong Kong a few years ago. Uh, and it's really bringing the art world together with you know, other communities and looking at the intersection that these two communities have and generating just a very fruitful uh, debate, dialogue, and exchange uh, just to uh, make the, the art world a better place. Um, we, going back to sustainability, we made a pledge in 2021. Uh, we are the first in the auction house to do such a pledge. I think so far we uh, even the only one, uh, to uh, be carbon neutral by 2030. And for us, being carbon neutral by 2030, with the original plan, we're learning so much at the beginning, and we continue to learn, we're going to talk about this a bit later, uh, basically meant reducing by 50% our carbon emission and buying credit to offset the rest. Now, where, where are we today? So in 2019, uh, we, we've published all this data is actually public because we, 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 uh, we publish a sustainability report every year. We had uh, one in March and we have one uh, in, um, in a few months from now. 2019, we emitted, we estimate that we emitted 79 uh, kilotons of carbon, uh, of CO2. And in 2022, we were down from 79 to 48.4. Okay, these are estimates. Uh, and I look forward to being able to dig into the detail of this data and, and, and share with you some of the initiatives that at Christie's we have, uh, we have taken. More importantly, I think there's a philosophy behind the pledge that we've made, and that philosophy is a 3C. You know, what, what other letter could it be when, when we are Christie's? It has to start with a C, I guess. The first C is to commit. That's what we've done in 2021. Uh, and as I said, is to be carbon neutral by 2030. This is independently assessed and approved by uh, the SBTI, so it's the science-based target initiative. So we're not just ourselves uh, you know, uh, running these numbers, we're making sure that this is also being independently uh, looked after. Commit. Second one is to communicate. Uh, so we had this report uh, last year. It's the second one we had. We will be having a yearly report on, on sustainability, reporting on our initiatives, reporting on our progress being transparent, sharing what we do, uh, sharing where we feel we've made progress, sharing where we feel maybe we're struggling as well uh, because we need uh, you know, to have this in the open and make sure uh, that um, you know, everybody is able to, uh, to understand what's going on and eventually to help us get better. And the last one is to collaborate. And I think that's all about this forum today. Uh, we have an active member of the Gallery Climate Coalition. It's about 800 players in the art world. Uh, who are together trying to find the best solution to address the uh, challenges of um, sustainability. Uh, uh, but we also wanted to host this forum. Uh, so we're so grateful to have you all here uh, to uh, be part of this discussion, uh, which is all about collaboration. Climate change is not about, or sustainability is not, is not a zero-sum game. You know, it's, it's the more you share, uh, the more you're able to uh, improve uh, for everybody. Uh, so I think that spirit is really driving us uh, today. 
Um, I look forward to sharing with you the, the initiatives that we've taken at Christie's, some of them uh, in, as well in Asia. You will see some uh, areas we've made progress, other areas we're still struggling, uh, and I think it's great just to be able to be open about uh, all of this. What I found particularly inspiring in going through uh, the detail of what we've been doing is just the extent, the sheer extent of the scope uh, of what needs to change. It's not about putting a couple of uh, plants here or there, it's not about switching uh, to recycle paper, it's not about, it's just the sheer extent and uh, the, 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 the breadth of the scope that needs to be addressed. It's about changing the way we think about business, it's about changing a lot of things across our touch points with our clients and the way, you know, at the back end things are being engineered. And, uh, and again, uh, the panel that we have today, I think I'm going to help us put a bit more light on, on these uh, challenges and what, um, you know, it looked like particularly at uh, Christie's. So that's it for my introduction. Again, a warm welcome to all of you. I, I hope you will find a lot of inspiring and thought-provoking uh, insights from uh, our panelists. Uh, and I hope that this is not the one and only. I do hope that we continue this conversation and, and have this really as a, as a kickstart for broader conversation and multiple interaction between uh, the art community and other players that could help us uh, create a more sustainable world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. Our first session this morning will be focused on the topic of sustainable design and architecture, led by Sarah, Johnny, and Damien, with our second session focused on the topic of art, the art industry's evolution in sustainability, led by Veronica, Betty, and Francis. To begin, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Ms. Sarah Klomps, on stage. Sarah is the director of Zaha Hadid Architects. She has been with Zaha Hadid Architects for 25 years, relocating to Hong Kong in 2017 to lead the Henderson development. She plays several key roles on, the, on Zaha Hadid Architecture's cultural, civic, and infrastructure scheme projects throughout Europe and internationally. For example, the Maxi, the Museum of the 21st Century Arts in Rome, the London Aquatic Center, and the Lewis and Richard Rosenthal Center for Contemporary Art in Cincinnati. She regularly lectures on construction methodology at architecture schools and industry events. And this morning, she will, pre she will be presenting on Shaping a Greener Future, how architects embrace sustainable design. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, good morning, and uh, thank you to Christie's for organizing this. I think it's incredibly important that we talk more and regularly about sustainability across the fields of design. Um, my name is Sarah Klums. I'm a director at Zahadid Architects, as uh, I was already introduced. And at Zaha Hadid's, we have, um, of course, we have an in-house um, environmental and sustainability team. We have an in-house low carbon group, which basically helps us to develop a whole set of different tools which we use in the design process, which help us to analyze um, how the buildings um, are shaped, how the buildings are um, detailed, etc. And um, but I wanted to give you for this talk a quick overview of all the different aspects which go into the design for an unsustainable buildings to, to really see it's a, it, it is not just a little add-on, um, but it is a full-blown exercise. In 2019, the uh, RBA uh, issued the 2030 Climate Challenge, which is a target which was based on the UK commitment to go carbon neutral and, and net zero by 2050. Based on that, there was a whole range of um, targets defined for architects to meet. So now we use this pledge or this target issued by the ROBA to, to go back and analyze our own buildings and basically see where we stand. So we, and we use this analysis then in order to inform our design process going forward. So we, for example, we, we took buildings such as the Milan Tower or the Lisa building uh, in, in Shanghai, and we analyzed in terms of embodied carbon, where do we sit in comparison to the targets issued uh, by the RRBA. Um, we looked then in greater detail why uh, those, um, where did we fail, where did, is improvement needed, and we did some kind of internal benchmarking, which then informed um, 
looking at all the different buildings. We have some a, a chart why uh, they are doing better or not so good, and then in, this informed basically the next step, uh, an identification of what opportunities are there for the different typologies, and we have developed from that key parameters which are important in order to make a building fully sustainable. For example, a residential for towers, it is, there is an, a, a perfect height, let's say. I mean, anything over 30 to 40 stories makes the structure so um, carbon heavy that really it is much more difficult uh, uh, to, to meet those targets. Um, at the same time, also operational carbon, which is how much energy do you need in order to run this building, where then factors play in, such as, the, of course, the mechanical uh, systems, the lighting system, the performance of the envelope. Um, and based on this analysis, we then did in-house very um, identified key criteria which need to be considered. For example, in the very early stages of the design, the site planning and the orientation, how is the building orientated? On the, build, on the screen you can see on the right, this is a tower we did in, in Central Bank for uh, Central Bank of Iraq in Baghdad, which obviously has a very high sun intensity. So we shaped the facade in a way to basically um, take away uh, the sun in the, in the, from the west and from the east because the low level sun was the most problematic one. So the entire tower is designed and orientated in order to um, combat the solar gains uh, on the facade. Similarly, our two, two projects you can see on the right there in Cap Sark in Saudi and um, uh, our recently completed Bihar headquarters in Saudi, they are shaped and orientated in a way that they basically shield um, to the south for the sun, and they have uh, courtyards which take the prevailing winds and help to ventilate the building. So the entire design philosophy was based around the climate and, and the prevailing wind, uh, the same on the bottom uh, for one of our studios uh, in Saudi. Structural efficiency, what I said before, a building, any, any building, over 30 to 40 stories is incredibly unsustainable in terms of embodied carbon. So our Henderson sits perfectly there at a, at a maximum height. Um, but then how to bring down embodied carbon further, it has a lot to do with the choice of materials. Um, of course, if you have timber structures, the embodied carbon is about 25% of that compared to a steel or a concrete structure. So we have a much less uh, a carbon heavy footprint. You can modify concrete uh, by cement replacement. For example, what we did on the aquatic center, you can substitute the cement um, with other materials, which basically helps you to, much, to create the concrete, which is much less um, carbon heavy. In the colder climates, at least in our regions where I come from in Europe, it's, it's very important that the envelope is, is, is very thermally acting uh, well, although I think the same can be said here because here it's just the other way around. Inside is colder than outside. But in the end, you need to prevent heat loss to the facade. So we look at how much insulation you need. Uh, we look at the extent of glazing towards uh, uh, envelope. So this building, for example, one of our buildings in Bulgaria has only 50% glazing, which of course helps again to offset heat loss along the facade. Or for buildings where you want a full glazed envelopes, um, for example, our building here in Marseille, we developed a double facade system, which allows you to have the full view, but at the same time, you don't have the heat loss because you create the buffer zone. Unfortunately, in Hong Kong, there are some limitations why this is not so easily possible. And I think there's a lot of industry leaders uh, who are trying to push against this. So that also here, double facades can at some point be introduced at the moment. They are just uh, punishable by, for, for a developer, it's very difficult to, to uh, because of the GFA pressures. Solar shading uh, is an important aspect. And then, of course, which is an entire un other industry, not architectural necessarily, but the building service industry, which needs, uh, which has a very uh, big influence on the performance and the operational carbon of uh, buildings. 
Lastly, uh, you can also, of course, consider low carbon energy sources. So on one hand is to reduce the operational energy of the building. On the other hand is to use uh, energy sources which are less uh, carbon intensive, such as renewables. Uh, we have on the Henderson incorporated uh, some uh, photovoltaics on the roof. These kind of renewable energy sources um, are, of course, um, much better in terms of operational energy. And uh, that is my part for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. For our next speaker, I'm delighted to introduce you to Mr. Johnny Yu. Johnny Yu is the advisor to the chairman at Henderson Land Development. He joined Henderson Land in 2020, and he leads the sustainability development of Henderson Land, having won the prestigious Business Leadership and Sustainability Award at the Asia Pacific Leadership in Green Building Awards in 2022, organized by the World Green Building Council. Johnny has 28 years of extensive experience covering multiple disciplines, including sales and marketing, investment advisory, accounting, tax, and risk management and control. He provides strategic advisory on property sales and marketing, policy formulation, digital transformation, and innovation. Johnny held various senior positions previously with UBS, Credit Suisse, and Pricewaterhouse in both Hong Kong and London, and is also a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales and Chartered Financial Analysts Institute. His topic this morning for us is Shaping a Smarter Future, Creating New Ways of Working and Living Enabled by Innovation and Technology. Welcome, Johnny. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's Johnny Yu here. Very pleased to be uh, here sharing my, my thoughts on sustainability with you. And thanks, uh, Francis, for your trust. OK, so let's begin by looking at um, our company. In case you're not familiar with Henderson Land, we have been around for many years. It was founded in 1976 by Dr. Lee Shou Key and currently being managed by our two chairmen, Dr. Martin Lee and Dr. Peter Lee. Um, instead of just having property management, property development, and property management businesses, we also have group companies underneath um, Henderson Land. So we are also in renewable energy under uh, town gas. We are also in hotel, travel, businesses, so on. And that's why we have to think about sustainability for the whole group rather than just Henderson Land. And if you were to look at our brands, you know, we have three promises. The first one is innovation. So innovation is always at the heart of our building design. And second one is sustainability. We take this very seriously. I'm going to explain to you why that's the case. And we often turn imagination into reality. So you imagine, and we make it happen for you. And we often try to protect the planets for future generations. And finally, people is also very important. We put people first in everything we do. And the reason why you know, at our industry we take sustainability seriously is because if you were to look at the carbon emissions coming from the real estate sector, electricity generation does account for 66% of the uh, carbon emission, and buildings account for 90% of this usage. And that's why, you know, as a responsible developer, we have a responsibility to the planet, to our people, and also to our city. And if you were to look at one very hot topic, which is climate change, it's affecting everybody. In Hong Kong, you know, we, um, Hong Kong is pledged to achieve carbon neutral by 2050, and we have to think about climate risk, sea level rise, especially when we have buildings close to the seaside. So these are all the factors that we have to take into account. And the way you know, we look at sustainability is that um, under um, the, the leadership of our two chairmen, we have very clear visions, which is to incorporate our sustainability strategies into our day-to-day -day operation to combat three major issues. The first one is uh, climate change. Second one is how do we improve health and wellness for our tenants and our clients. And finally, how do we promote a sustainable city? In order to do that, we have a strategy which is very easy to remember, GIVE, G-I-V-E, green, innovation, value for people, and endeavor for community. When I talk about green, you know, in order to um, reduce our carbon, we have been working on a lot of green buildings and also healthy buildings, you know, starting from over 20, 10 years ago. So in, in terms of number of green and health certs, we probably have the largest number, over 100 of them in Hong Kong. And innovation, we focus on technology innovation as well as um, social innovation. So what I meant by that is that uh, we often challenge the existing conventions and innovate in the way that we build and we design. 
and also um, people health and wellness, and uh, we have to care about the overall community as well. So now let, let me give you an example, which is the Henderson Building at uh, number two Mary Road, which is a very iconic building. It's an icon amongst all the icons. I'm very pleased to um, uh, say that you know, Christie's will be moving in next year as we share the same vision in terms of sustainability. So it, the, the building does focus on a few, um, few areas, you know, green, smart, health, Totalizations and resilient. You can see, you know, the, the building design is very unique. Um, I can tell you, this is designed by Saha Hadid, uh, by Sarah's. This is Sarah's work. So, uh, a lot of curve. You know, the um, build, the shape of the building. Some people think it's a palace. Some people think this is a spaceship. But I can tell you that the shape of the building is inspired by the shape of a bohemia bud, which is about about to blossom. So that's the shape of the building. And in terms of sustainability, you know, it's very impressive that even though that the building is not complete yet, but we have already achieved seven preserved platinum, uh, highest rating in uh, green cert and health cert. And also for smart features, you know, for wide score and smart score, which are uh, benchmark, international benchmark for measuring smart building and also measuring connect, uh, digital connectivity. And for smart score, we score 100 you know, full marks, which is the first in Hong Kong to achieve this um, achievement. And the building also won the Grand Building Award from Hong Kong Green Building Council. Um, in terms of our partners, you know, we always work with um, the best partners in the street. You know, for example, Microsoft Hong Kong on IT, uh, PwC on IT securities. And we, we also use, make use of digital twin technology. And what I mean by digital twin, basically it's a virtual representation of the physical building where you can perform a lot of testing, monitoring, analysis, so that it does help us in terms of monitoring, monitoring um, energy efficiency. And also we're making use of building information modeling you know, in, 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 the building, uh, in the design, in the construction stage, so that we can closely monitor the cost and budget and in terms of the glasses, you know, they're very unique. You know, um, one day if you, you know, um, have time, you can go to the central area, look at the uh, ex exterior building. The windows are made up of four ply, double laminated, double curved windows, which are designed to withstand, you know, extreme weather conditions. And that's why, you know, um, a month or two ago, when you had the black rain, when we had the super typhoon, nothing was affected, you know, our buildings were designed to withstand um, extreme weather and there was minimal impact to our building. And then the glasses will cut out all the UV harmful um, UV light and that's why when Christie's have their artwork in our building, you know, they're not going to be damaged by the sunlight. And also there's um, a key feature uh, which will make people feel more comfortable working in the office. Yeah. Well, we work together with uh, consultants on this, which is called the Solar Responsive Ventilator, the SR3. So imagine you know, um, you're sitting by the window. So sometimes when the sun is in the way, so you may feel a bit hot sitting by the window. So the traditional way will be to lower the blinds so, uh, so, so you may not feel as hot as before, but then it will reduce your visibility. So the way to reduce or solve this problem is that we have a weather pillar in the building which constantly monitor the humidity, the temperature, you know, the um, air, air quality. And then this information will be fed into a building management system. And if they feel that the building is, is a bit uh, too hot, cool air will be coming out from the edge of the window, which is just like a Dyson fan, you know, cooling you off. So you will feel comfortable working in the, um, in the building. And also in the surrounding, there's a lot of um, uh, greeneries and we try to promote people to, um, you know, promote walkability and connectivity in this building. So, um, and again, you know, we do make use of artwork in a lot of the, our commercial and residential building as well. So this is um, a very unique artwork that you will see uh, when one day you come to visit this building. And the other features I just touched on briefly, I know time is running out. And Hong Kong, we are promoting electric vehicles and we are at, always at the forefront of everything we do. So for this uh, car park where we have 265 car parking spaces, all of them are equipped with EV charges. So probably the first you see in Hong Kong, you haven't probably have not seen another commercial building where you, know, you have um, all the EV charges in the building. And also hands-free touchless features. So imagine you, know, you park your car, you have a coffee on one hand and then your briefcase on the other hand. All you have to do is just turn on your mobile phone Bluetooth feature and then it will take you directly to your floor 
without touching any of the um, building exterior buildings and also making use of the apps to operate a lot of the um, uh, features and then we have a very unique banquet room right at the top of the building made up of um, uh, glass roofs and then you can see through the ceiling as well on level 22 where you have where we have a space for people to practice yoga and to relax and finally you know uh, when we talk about sustainability we cannot do it alone we have to do it with our partners and our tenants so we have introduced the first ESG partnership program at the Henderson where we are not only just working between the landlord and the tenant, but we introduce the extra element, which is individual clients. So this is called the lead program, landlord, individual uh, employees, and also the tenant. So we have to work hand in hand to reduce carbons together. Of course, you know, if our people are supportive of doing this initiative, they will be rewarded Henderson coins, and then they can make use of the hand coins in our supermarket, you know, in other subsidiary businesses. Um, so that's a brief summary of our um, uh, sustainability work at Henderson. We can go through it in a bit in a bit more details at the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. We're very excited to be moving in. Um, the next speaker for this morning session is Mr. Damien Tang. With a career spanning over 20 years in public service, Damien has held senior management roles and played key roles in strategic planning and design committees. His expertise lies in interdisciplinary planning, design, and the implementation of biophilic strategies across environmental sectors. He currently sits in the URA Design Advisory Plan Panel for Strategic Projects, and his commitment to public service has been acknowledged with awards such as the 2020 National Day Public Administration Medal conferred by the Prime Minister Office in Singapore. Damien was president of the International Federation of Landscape Architects Asia-Pacific Region between 2016 and 2020, and was also the president of Singapore's Institute of Landscape Architects between 2009 and 2015. His topic this morning is Shaping a Sustainable Future, the Intersection of Landscape Design and Sustainability. Welcome, Damien. Hi, good morning, everyone. This is uh, really a privilege to be here, to be uh, in a very unique forum talking about art and sustainability. But of course, from what I'm going to share is coming from you know, the landscape beyond buildings, because I believe that when we design you know, anything from the built environment, is not just inside out, but also outside in. And my topic today is really very quickly and brief. Of course, later I'll share more in my uh, panel discussion. Singapore has been transformed from a garden city to a city in a garden, and now a city in nature. The evolution of this is required is because we have moved, as time moves, bringing nature into every part of our urban developments and also bringing science and evidence-based approach into the projects that we do. And you can see from government point of view, when we actually do our planning, we do it from a very broad level, a city level, where we connect parks, gardens, nature all together and making sure that all this connection has biodiversity and also nature that flows and wildlife that actually comes along. Singapore is so small that we often forgot that being a small nation, we do actually have the power to actually transform and create things beyond our imagination. And this is exactly why the connection of biodiversity is important, because we are also in the Australasia flyway where migratory birds come to our little land. Now, beyond greenery, that, that is where we have to work with PUB, the national water agencies, to really transform the water and canals and bring nature into our um, heartlands. Of course, back in um, the government sectors, when I do a lot of strategic planning, I also advocate a lot of architects, developers, thinking about the touch points. Because it is all these touch points that we don't really see and we have possibly even forgotten that, is, that has the potential of bringing greenery. You can see from beside buildings having skyrise greenery, development buffers, pedestrian uh, overhead bridges, linkways, drainage, sometimes even under viaducts or sometimes even spaces where don't, we don't always think greenery is possible. Now, this is one image that I have 
you know, shown and created a transformational master plan where we talk about you know, breaking canals, bringing in greenery, and bringing people into these spaces. And that is how this sort of master plan back then I was, we have definitely many roadblocks, but great that even that time, our MM, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, have seen this master plan and decided and said that this is the way Singapore should be. Of course, knowing the context of Hong Kong, we are very restricted and we can find possibilities of finding, you know, what are the possible areas that we can integrate such a greenery. And you can see this Bishan Amokyo Park is exactly the kind of spaces that we hope you know, people can come near to the river and enjoy and being close without actually having danger, you know, getting to it. Now, of course, we speak a lot about biophilic buildings. Biophilic buildings is really, you know, integration of greenery into buildings and making buildings feel like nature. Now, why, why do we do that? We have to understand, first of all, Singapore do not have mountains, you know, inlands, and a lot of, you know, our, our big resources of uh, nature areas, natural uh, scenic area. So this is where we have to create all this greenery into the heartlands, into the buildings that we develop. And of course, from even the housing, public housing point of view, we have also moved through the years, bringing from level one, three, you know, you can see in all these different levels, there are skyrise greenery in it. And looking downwards, from appreciation of the city skylines to the spaces where communities can gather and also to the spaces where you know, greenery are just you know, out of your window and you can see it, sometimes you even touch it. Even for uh, integrated development like this, Oasis, um, Terraces, Pongo, well, these are not exactly our projects or my projects, but it is projects that has been influenced through the policy that we introduced. We want to make sure that greenery becomes so pervasive that even integrated projects like that, where there is senior uh, housing, also get in integrated with medical services, childcare, and many different services that they can all go within the reach of you know, five, 10 minutes, all within one development. And of course, this is where we also have brought greenery and also our partners into uh, Hong Kong. Of course, this is one of the Henderson land um, you know, uh, uh, projects where we have brought this skyrise greenery you know, to the hearts of Hong Kong. Now, here, the opportunities for greenery is tremendous. Actually, it is all about how do we introduce it in the right way, with the right technology and the right solutions. And of course, now I don't have much time to go into the, my presentation, but more importantly about biophilic buildings is about creating proximity to nature because all of us have this very instinctive need for nature. We want to be connected with nature. And that is why every time when you have uh, time for a holiday, you want to go to somewhere, you can see mountains, you know, go somewhere where you can see the sea. This is in fact the biophilic nature of what we already have. And more importantly, it is really for the people. And now I would just quickly show these slides where I want to say that whether it's building, whether it's the environment, the spaces in cities, we have to create platforms where people can do voluntary or non-voluntary activities and also being part of you know, meeting, uh, a space where we can meet people because all of us are actually community creatures. We like to be around people, even though you may not like to be directly be interacting with them because we are all part of you know, this whole society, social compact. We, we want to be close to another human beings. Now, exactly also, biophilic buildings are also platforms possible for urban farming, uh, household gardening. And this is important because as you are so stressed in all our daily work, we need to de-stress. And sometimes having spaces like that where you do gardening, even though you may not have the space, looking into skyrise solutions where we can actually bring gardening and spaces for some of these activities to take place. So with that, I want to end with this poem because my, I myself, uh, I'm an artist and also a, and a designer. I'm a scientist and an engineer. I'm a professional activist that care for nature and people. I know no boundaries when it comes to fighting for our future. For there is only one earth, one family. It is now or never. Thank you. Thank you so much, Damien. Please remain on stage as we begin our panel discussion. Um, I'd also like to invite our panelists, Sarah and Johnny, to join us on stage now.
thank you all for your, uh, each three of you for your sharing. It was um, incredibly interesting to see how your different roles play within the sustainability topic and conversation. Um, so for this topic today, we're going to start um, our first part focusing on icons and sustainability. All three of you talked about iconic design. Um, and I think my first question is to Sarah. Ensuring sustainability is factored in at every stage of the project is no small feat. Um, could you share with us a little bit on how iconic buildings are created whilst ensuring these sustainable commitments can be done from planning to design to construction materials and operation? Yes, I can. Um, I mean, in the end of the day, building an iconic building versus building a, let's say, normal building, it's the same process um, the same steps you have to go through in order to make this truly sustainable. Um, I think I showed a little, I gave a little crash course in what are the different steps you need to do in architecture in order to achieve that, which we saw in my talk. But I think to summarize it, the most important thing is that everyone has to come together. It is not down to the architect alone. It's not down to the designer alone. It is down to the client. It is down to the user. It is down to the builder. Um, it starts with where is the site, it starts with how tall are we making this building, what is going to go inside this building. So there is a whole range of decisions which, which, which are being made and which need to be followed through in order to become truly sustainable. It, construction process alone, where are uh, the materials brought from? Some of my projects, like the London Aquatic Centre, which had to hit uh, BRIAM Excellent, which is a very difficult certification. Um, there was the need for us to contemplate how we're bringing the materials on site. So there was a massive effort done in bringing the materials by ship or by rail instead of transport, because this was factored into the certification in terms of whether the construction was uh, sustainable, where does the waste of the construction go. Um, and then, of course, the typical things we all know of and we all typically talk about, such as how much energy does the building consume? Is there too, too much uh, uh, or too little insulation on the building? But this is only an aspect, a small aspect. In, in the end, the entire range of making a building and then using a building has to change in order to, for us to make really an impact. Thank you. And I know apart from the London Aquatic Centre, you also worked um, on another iconic site, which is the CBI, the Central Bank of Iraq. So uh, I'm sure that was also a very interesting project. Yeah, for that one, we actually did together with Max Fordham um, an analysis of whether steel or concrete is better, because it is depending on the region. And that was located in Baghdad, in, in Iraq. And, and, and it, it showed ultimately that that concrete was even though typically it's not as good as steel uh, in terms of embodied carbon, in this case it was better because it was locally available. Mm -hmm. I see. So local is um, preferable sometimes. Thank you. Um, from Iraq, we'll move to Hong Kong, and my next question is to Johnny. Um, and Johnny, at Henderson, you lead, you have the hat as a sustainability development of the company, uh, winning awards, I believe, kind of a few years ago with the Green Building Awards. Um, the question is, as you work with different business units within the company, of which you mentioned just now, um, together with tenants and the community of businesses at Henderson, what do you think are the key factors that ensure the alignment of business goals and sustainability, and ultimate pushing forward these goals? Yes, yeah, Sarah, yes. Um, the award that we won, you know, we were very pleased to have won the um, award from World Green, World Green Building Council, that was from last year, and then the year before, you know, it was from Hong Kong Green Building Council. The good news is, you know, apart from these two, we also won a lot of awards from Bloomberg and various other organizations. The bad news is, you know, once you have won a big award, you cannot enter into the competition again in the <laughs> short term. So, so in the short term, you may not hear that Henderson will be getting another big award. Um, so in terms of, our, you know, um, our vision, you know, how we uh, achieve the goals and targets, you know, the way that we do it, you know, is similar to what Francis was mentioning earlier, you know, commitment, communication and collaboration. We do all this, you know, um, at Henderson Land, and that's why I think, you know, Christie's and um, Henderson are very aligned in terms of, of, our, of our visions in sustainability. 
when we talk about um, a commitment, you know, it's all the way driven from the top, from the um, chairman's level, where we have very clear strategies in place, you know, how we incorporate this into our day-to-day -day work. But you need a working group, you know, which is um, uh, made up of different um, colleagues from different departments to work together to drive this uh, targets, and then we have to constantly monitor the progress as well to make sure that they are they are on track. And at the same time, you know, we have to not only collaborate with people internally but also people externally. And that's what I mentioned earlier. When we try to achieve uh, carbon reduction, we cannot do it alone. We have to do it with our tenants, especially when we are looking at uh, scope three analysis. You know, um, car indirect um, carbon emission, which is very tricky. Imagine you look at all your upstream and downstream activities, you know, upstream, you know, look at your suppliers, you know, will they be able to provide you with low embod you know, embody um, carbon materials, you know, are they willing to, or, you know, even if they are willing to cooperate, you know, um, how accurate is the information? Is it complete? You know, is it accurate? So you have to do a lot of um, third party and internal uh, verification. As an accountant, you know, I often have to challenge the numbers if they don't look correct. Um, and also, you know, I'm working together to um, advocate, you know, sustainability to everybody. Um, so I think collaboration, my experience dealing with um, Christie's has been very positive, especially, you know, when we enter into the leasing agreement, we also enter into uh, a memorandum of understanding on the green lease. So we are trying to, you know, think about how do we reduce waste, reduce water and reduce energy together. And also earlier this year, when we were invited by uh, BBC and also World Green Building Council to take part in a video series to promote health and wellness. Mm. You know, the first tenant that I thought of, thought of was Christie's. Mm -hmm. So that's why we invited uh, Christie's to uh, take part in this video to uh, collaborate and to advocate uh, the importance of sustainability, health and wellness together through different social media channels. I think the channels now is, uh, you know, is much more effective com compared to before. So the one that we did with BBC is not through TV channels, it's through their social media channels, together with our channels, Christie's channels, and our partners' channels. Um, and finally, you know, we, um, I want to say, you know, we always put people first in everything we do, as we mentioned. And that's why, you know, when we talk to Christie's about, you know, um, our anchor tenant moving into the Henderson, we have to think about ways to collaborate together. So when we know that there will be a lot of artwork moving into the building, mm -hmm. we have worked together to design a crane and a jeep, you know, at the back of the building, so that it make it easier, you know, um, in future for Christie's to move, you know, to the, the big art pieces. You know, from um, you know, from outside into the building, and um, so I would say this is like uh, my personal experience dealing with Christie's has been very positive. We are both very um, <laughs> into sustainability. Thank you. Um, I it's a really delight. It's wonderful to hear you know that real estate developers do take into account the tenants that are coming in, and with the mem memorandum of understanding, I think that also adds to the importance and the focus of both. I think us at Christie's as well as um, Henderson's focus on sustainability. Thank you, Johnny. Um, my next question is to Damien. Um, you are at the forefront of contemporary urban development innovation in your different roles and responsibilities. And you're often invited to speak at international conferences as an ambassador for green innovation. Um, and this, you previously spoke about and espoused the notion of circular cities. Um, could you share and speak a little bit more on this and yes. how it relates to sustainability? Well, yeah, thank you for the question. In fact, I think there are some slides. In, when, when I brought together the four global organizations, which is the uh, International Federation of Landscape Architects, IFLA, ISOCAP, which is the planners, URA, the architects, and WFEO, which is the engineering organizations. So we organized the Circular Cities Summit. And with that, we want to advocate the future is about creating circular uh, cities. And you can see from the slide, it is in the era of how we do it is not what we built. And it is important to even understand from the business point of view. Because when, after I left the public service and joined Unisil Group, we have turned ourselves, or actually we transformed ourselves from a product suppliers to a solutions provider and looking at how can we enable architects, consultants, developers to introduce solutions and products that really can help on the climate impacts. And of course, I won't go into all these things. Uh, more importantly, is really understanding the solutions and technology that we now need. And even for business entities, we need to rethink about our role in how we deal with our own business entities and transform uh, towards the circular economy. 
Now, I think just now one of the speakers, is it Johnny or probably Francis, also say that it's not just about what we built and how we built it. There is also the other aspect of economics. There are also the other aspects of the value chain. And also, how do we relook our business model and turn it into a circular business model? So, of course, my uh, ed executive education comes from Cambridge. I did the circular economy and sustainability strategies. And I also have to transform and really turn the business into thinking that nothing goes to waste. From the resource down to the production, optimizations, all the way to consumption, reuse, take-back programs, product as a service, and so on. So I think this is really, in a nutshell, understanding what circular cities are, really about resource management, how you plan up front, whether you actually put certain uh, uh, clusters, businesses, economy that share the same uh, functions, commitment, and also in many different areas. As I flash all these little points, you can see that nothing re relies on just one industry or one profession, sorry. And it really requires all of us to come together. And this is also the part where we talk about collaboration, the collaboration across industries. And this is exactly uh, what Christie's have actually done, to look at collaboration across industry to bring all of us together. Now, if that is too complex, let me just summarize in three <laughs> principles, simple ones. Eliminate waste and pollution. Because if we don't do it now, we'll never do it again, and our f future generation will suffer, because the time is now. And how do we circulate products, materials, at the highest value? and definitely regenerate you know, nature from there. So I think this is really understanding you know, what we do uh, towards moving into sustainability, because sustainability is so broad. And this, this circular economy, circular cities, is more defined. There are clearer goals for us to work on. And each of us, whether as individual, whether as um, uh, business entities or organizations, we can all play a part. And it's a whole value chain that we need to influence and we need to come together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Johnny was talking about working together, you know, from a real estate perspective and Christie's as an art industry. And uh, you're also saying the need for us to come together. So from kind of this cross industry perspective of art and sustainability, um, have you worked with art industry clients and what role do you see art playing in advocating for green innovation and sustainability within your remit? Well. First of all, I actually see, although with my profession, I, I'm I kind of at a crossroad of professions. I was really privileged to, you know, I have the architecture degree. Since young, I started off graphics designer, interior design, and then work across, you know, agencies with planners, uh, engineers as well. Now, why am I an artist is because when I do my landscape or architecture design, just like Sarah, you will look at yourself as, you know, a, an artist. But it cuts with scientific uh, uh, applications, evidence-based approach. And this is how, when we need to work with, let's say, an art, it is about the appreciation. In fact, art is a universal language. You need certain appreciation to understand or go further into deeper appreciation of other things more complex as like sustainability. So to me, I think art is a language where if to a layman, they may not understand the science, they may not understand why climate change and so on, let something catches the eye visually, or at least the story, be because behind art, there are, or, uh, there are always narratives, stories, to hopefully inspire people. And I think this is where the inspiration needs to kick in, to touch people's heart, to know what we need to do for the uh, future of the generation. Sarah, would you have anything to add to that between the crossroads of art and architecture? Yeah, I, I think Damien is very right. I, I mean, there, there is sort of this misconception that if you go sustainable, everything is going to become dull and boring and not look good anymore, right? But there is, there is a little bit of this. And I think art has the art and the art industry has the potential to, to, to show that this is exactly not the case. And, and this shouldn't be the case, and this can be fun, and can be exciting, can be beautiful, can be iconic, whatever we want to call it. And I think, I think, I think there, the art has, has an incredible power, I think, to convince and, and bring people together. Thank you. Um, Johnny. You mentioned uh, innovation as one of the three pillars within Henderson's project and one of the focuses. Um, how can innovation and iconic spaces be created with the least carbon footprint, both in sourcing of materials and for the, pre uh, for the future preservation when we talk about its life cycle? And how can we relate that or join it together with our community? 
Yeah, um, I think when we look at our business, you know, I look at the life cycle of the um, building industry, starting from um, the moment when you acquire a piece of land. So we have to perform a lot of biodiversity assessment to the design stage where we have to think about, you know, how do we design our buildings so that we can have more natural light, lighting and also um, increase the ventilation. So hence reducing the use of air con. Um, you probably are w may be aware that for a building, you know, majority of the carbon emission does come from the chiller and the air con. Does account for 50, 60 percent at least, you know, so by using less air con, you know, then there will be less carbon emission um, to, to the city and to the community. And then to the, um, uh, and then you move on to the construction stage, we have to think about use of sustainable material. And that's why we have a policy on uh, sustainable procurement, you know, how do we source from our supplier? And then move on to, you know, the project uh, or, or the property management stage where we have to use, you know, um, high, you know, um, high tech technology to monitor energy efficiency. Sometimes it's not just about um, replacing the chiller to achieve more efficiency. Sometimes it's more like how do you optimize not only the temperature, but also the humidity, you know, of a building. So it's a combination of the of the two. People often think, okay, it's very hot, let's turn the temperature down, but you have to take humidity into, into consideration when you do this. And then, you know, how do we finance this project? We have to think about green finance. So we work with over 10 uh, local and international banks, you know, in Hong Kong uh, to finance our green projects, and we have a lot of them in place. So this is, you know, when we think about the life cycle, this is what we think about, you know, the way use of innovation, technology, and social innovation to reduce carbon. And the next thing, you know, relating to community, you know, since the topic today is on arts and sustainability, so I think it is worth uh, to tell you that at Henderson Land, you know, we have started um, using the arts element back in 2012 to 2016 when we first worked on, let me show you, uh, the Double Cove um, project. You know, this is uh, one of the big projects that we worked on um, nearly 10 years ago. And in the clubhouse and the, uh, you know, um, inside and outside of the clubhouse, you can see there are a lot of art element. And this is where people can realize your imagination, you know, to, um, you know, to realize um, health and wellness, you know, um, and the additional element that we inject into our properties. And we, we um, build places, as I said, you know, we have to think about the surrounding. So for example, you know, uh, I just thought of an example, Baker Circle in Hong Kong. Um, if you were to walk around in Hong Kong area, the streets are quite narrow. They're only two meters wide. But after we, we develop the areas, you know, the streets will be widened to 3.5 meters. So it does enhance the walk, you know, uh, walking experience in the neighborhood. And the other examples that I can use um, is um, Art Lane. You know, how do we um, uh, bring vibrancy, vibrancy, vibrancy into the community? If you were to look at this uh, project, um, Art Lane in Sai Ying Pun, look at how it looks before, you know, at the top. You know, it was quite uh, run down, a bit dark in the alleyway. And so what we did was we worked with the NGO, we worked with the government, and we worked with the um, residents in the neighborhood, you know, to bring in um, 17 local and international artists to do paintings on the exterior, exterior walls of the building. So as a result, you can see, you know, there's a lot, um, it looks a lot um, more beautiful than before. And then when you go there, you probably have noticed a lot of people do take selfies, you know, taking pictures in the neighborhood. And also we are not just doing that in, um, in Sai Ying Pun, but also in um, um, Tai Kok Choi in, on the Kowloon side. So this is also another project, you know, where we bring in um, different artists from different backgrounds to help to make the community um, a lot better versus than before. And of course, you know, we work with many artists, you know, um, um, in our journey. So uh, Mr. Hoffman is one of them. So last um, beginning of this year, when he came um, to Hong Kong, you know, he gave us a souvenir, which is like two small yellow ducks as an appreciation of us, you know, using his artwork in the residential building in Phan Lang. So this is the, his first art piece in the Hong Kong residential project. Um, and also we have other artistic art design at the bottom of the page. And then often, you know, apart from art, we would think about um, biodiversity issue where we have butterfly garden, um, firefly habitats. And then when we design this uh, smart flower shape, solar panel. People often just think about using, you know, flat, you know, boring PV, 
when we come to design, we have an artistic design, which is a sunflower shape, where it can maximize um, energy efficiency by 40%, and it does track the sunlight um, movement, you know, while it is, um, make, you know, um, uh, using the renewable energy uh, businesses. And then also urban farming and hydroponic is an important way to educate our future generations of the importance for them to be mindful of the relationships between sustainability, uh, food, and also um, um, uh, science, you know. So I would say these are some of the examples that I can show you where we make use of art, where we make use of um, other features. And finally, you know, uh, there's one big project that we are working on, which is uh, Site 3 Central Harbour Front, which is just outside of IFC. Again, you see there's a lot of greens, a lot of um, connectivity and walkability in this project. We cannot disclose too much yet, but what I can tell you is that we have already obtained platinum rating from the Hong Kong Green Building Council for this project. So these are some of the examples that we are contributing to the community. Thank you. And those are fantastic examples. Um, I particularly like the one where you talked about some of the old areas in, in Hong Kong. And it actually leads me very easily to my next question, um, perhaps to, to, to Sarah. Because all three of you are creating new icons. And Sarah, you really are in the midst of all that. Um, yet in the topic of sustainability, when we think about areas like Tai Kok Choi, um, restoration and retrofitting can also restore old buildings back into its former glory and gain success in making the buildings more sustainable um, and breathing life into those communities. Um, perhaps, Sarah, you'd like to share a little bit more on your views on retrofitting um, and projects that you have taken part in as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a retrofit and reuse is, is probably one of the biggest words at the moment in, in terms of the architectural discussion and sustainability because it's an absolute no-brainer if a building is already there to use it instead of to knock it down is, is the least carbon fit, footprint. Um, We've done a couple of uh, extension projects uh, in Antwerp. I don't know if you know it. It's, it's, it's basically this old building, and we uh, have a, an extension. It's usually extension projects, so an extension on top. The Serpentine Gallery in, in Hyde Park in London is pretty much an extension to an existing building. Oxford is a connection between two listed buildings. And then we basically incorporated, um, uh, it's, it's a school, uh, so a new university, um, uh, an extension between two buildings. Um, I think that's about it. I mean, we would love to do more. Um, usually people don't think about refurb when they think about Zahadid, but I think we'd be more than ready to, and we will embrace much more reuse and because in, in London, for example, the, the, the new rules in terms of carbon, um, what you have to hit, it's almost impossible for a developer to build a new building in the city of London and knock something down because it's just no longer feasible. So therefore, more and more projects come on the market where they're looking for architects to reuse um, and adapt. I don't know if Damien or Johnny have anything to add with regards to this. Well, I guess for myself, I because. In the past, I was with the government for more than 20 years. In fact, the icons, I don't create it myself. I actually introduce policy and thinking across agencies and also to the architects. And collectively, they created the icon for Singapore. Now, for me, moving forward, it's not about creating physical icon or visible icon. I think I, my role would be the invisible one, the invisible icons of circularity and sustainability. And sometimes it's even through the solutions that we provide. Because even for our company, if there are people who are surprised that our system using 100% recycled plastics, which we, by the way, we collect plastics uh, every year, about 3,000 tons from the environment, and turn it into the products and solutions that you see just now. Mm -hmm. So those were the ones where can we stand very high compressive strength through research, R&D, and innovation. And this is exactly how and moving forward, we wanted and we hope that in terms of solution, the invisible icons could be also appreciated and used uh, in areas where people do not you know, take, uh, are understood very well. And sometimes even things taken for granted, uh, having seen that you know, things more f are visible and things that are invisible. So for me, it's really about the unseen one right now. So this is my role. Just to add, I think um, that's why I think this is very important right at the design stage when we build new buildings. You know, we have to make sure that they are energy efficient, you know, they are designed for people, you know, who will, add, you know, um, 
um, enjoy you know, working and staying in the building. And for the older buildings, I think when we knock them down and then we develop, and that's why right at the beginning, I said that we often have to you know, challenge the existing conventions, how we build and design, and then think of, of ways to increase, like what we mentioned before, you know, increase ventilation, increase lighting, hence less, you know, less um, dependent on air con. And then we also have to think about how do we deal with waste and you know, waste management, which is also an important topic. You probably do not realize this, is that in Hong Kong, you know, in the property management business, you know, uh, it's very difficult to hire people right now. <laughs> so you have to make use of robots, you know, and use of technologies, use of um, um, high-tech monitoring system, you know, in order to solve that problem. So, um, so these are some of the other factors that we have to consider when we, you know, not only at the design stage, but also um, at the final product stage, you know, how we manage the building try to make use of innovations and help us as much as we can. Make use of AI is also an important, you know, um, ChatGPT has helped us to <laughs> do a lot of, um, help us to solve a lot of the issues, I would say. Um, I feel like we're definitely moving into the tech side, so stay tuned for our next Art and Tech Summit. I, I'm sure we have lots of topics that we can uh, cross uh, discuss as well. Um, let's move on to the second kind of part of our discussion, and that's on aesthetics, beauty, and sustainability. We're, we're sitting here at Christie's. Um, you're just kind of walking through the doors. You'll see beautiful works of art, and of course, here at Christie's, beauty and aesthetics is at the forefront of our considerations. And, and I think Sarah mentioned just now, and before we, we were, when we were brainstorming as well, um, there are lots of buildings and structures that do follow strong principles of sustainability, um, but oftentimes they're quite uninspiring to look at, and they can be quite bulky and quite, quite ugly. So um, I think my first question in this, in this section goes to Damien, because I've always admired um, the Singapore public housing estates, because every time I go through, I see there's beauty in, in the design. You see kind of levels of green um, with floors dedicated to green space. So what would your advice be when we think about beauty and art and aesthetics in the overall landscape planning? Well, first of all, I think nature does wonders. Even in a very square, blocky, you know, rectilinear, simple design, the moment you incorporate nature, you can actually enhance it. Now, of course, there are different ways of curate the nature and the design. Because a lot of people take for granted, oh, there's just trees, just plants. But there is also the finesse and mastery in how you design one that, is, that supports biodiversity. At the same time, it's naturalistic in such a way where you can appreciate that nature. So for us, even in, back then uh, with National Park Sport, we do not go for the topiary style. You know, it's very much all the curated in such a way whereby it's naturalistic. Understanding the ecosystem, the native plants, how it's being grouped together. Understand you know, the prospect and refuge theory. I know a lot of people don't know, but it's something that I introduced to the industry because there is a certain way of looking and studying how you visually you know, uh, study a landscape where it can attract you. All this, actually, I learned and I actually observed and also researched into the so-called biophilic environment. That means an environment that can draw people in into a landscape. There is always this messy ecosystem where people cannot appreciate, or oh, I don't want to go into the forest, so, you know, it's so scary. But there is also the curated ecosystem where it does the same function. In fact, it can even be better that it draws you in. Now, people appreciate that, that is aesthetics. And the moment you actually allow people to as, uh, appreciate that, you start to put signage, education, and people understand why certain things are together. So I think there are a lot of different ways of understanding design and how it, you know, we actually work with you know, um, going deeper into putting things together and not just you know, um, having you know, certain things taken for granted where we just say, oh, these are just plants, these are just nature and, and so on. So, I, I can go on for an hour and so, but of course, this is generally what I think that, you know, aesthetics really come from each individual designer understanding the nature and bring together into the form and function. Okay. Thank you, Damien. Um, Sarah, I asked Johnny about, um, you know, his life cycle that he was talking about. And of course, when we think about <clears throat> upstream sourcing of materials with sustainability in mind, um, you mentioned concrete, steel, we had plastic. So they're very kind of not 
I suppose beauty is not the first thing that comes to mind. Um, perhaps you could share a little bit more about the material choices that create that harmony that Damien was mentioning, um, that can create beauty and aesthetics while utilizing new, innovative, and sustainable material. I mean, concrete and steel can be incredibly beautiful, by the way. Yeah, I was going to say, we make it <laughs> um, beautiful. No, no. Um, I think. Innovative, well, there is a lot of innovative um, materials out there nowadays uh, which, which help in the sustainability aspect. They're typically, at the moment, not visible. So it's a lot uh, in the foundations, in the insulation. Um, uh, on the finish side, i.e. what you see exposed to view, I suppose there are some recycled textiles, wall claddings, floor claddings, etc., out there. But I think generally, Recycled materials is good, but it also takes a lot of carbon to recycle them, mm. right? Yes, we have a garbage problem and we need to do something with it. Uh, ideally, buy less, but, but that's a different issue. Um, so yes, there's a lot of material we need, need to be used. To make that into something which is beautiful look at usually consumes quite a lot of energy. There are some cre clever products out there, but I think generally speaking, the idea would be more to go back to natural materials to use natural stone, to use natural timber, to use, you know, to, to, to try to incorporate those materials which are basically zero in body carbon because they're already there. Mm. Uh, yes, you need to machine them, so there's going to be a little bit of loss going into it. But in the end of the day, they're natural materials and they last. You know, they, they weather beautifully. So I think there is a tendency to try to do that rather than um, rely on, on, on new materials to solve our problem. Although there are clever materials out there, but so far not in the finishes so much. I understand. Well, we look forward to the future, of course. Um, Johnny, working for kind of one of the largest real estates here in Hong Kong, I'm sure you're also faced with multifaceted challenges in creating iconic spaces, which also need to be profitable and practical. Um, balancing profitability, beauty, and sustainability principles can be quite the juggling act. Um, could you share perhaps a personal experience or a story on how you strike a balance between your decision making and in the designs? Yeah, I, I think we have to work together with um, people internally to answer that question. You know, <laughs> especially on cost, we have to talk to finance. You know, on design, we talk to project managers, um, and so on. But I think uh, it is important that. Uh, people often think, oh, you work on all these green buildings, platinum level, it must cost a lot of money to do it. But in reality, it's not the case. If you were to talk to our project managers, the incremental cost <coughs> of moving from gold to platinum, assume you have the capability of doing so, you know, it's not as much as you think. Um, the, other question, the, the other point that you have to look at is, I don't know how often you walk around in Central, but nowadays if you walk around in IFC or you know, our, um, the, the, the other developers, what you notice is that at the entrance of the building, you see all this green label, health label being stuck on the um, entrance of the building. Uh, for example, IFC, you see the well platinum, you see the Beam Plus, which is building environmental as as assessment method for Hong Kong, you know, Beam Plus uh, platinum. So the reason why we do this or why other people are also doing the same thing is because the tenants are looking for, you know, grade A offices, or depends on what you know, more tenants, but if you are uh, an international company, quite often they cannot move to a building where energy efficiency does not meet a certain standard. Um, so the, the ones that we have been talking to, often, you know, the first question that they ask is not, you know, uh, how much it is to rent your office, but, you know, uh, what, you know, certification level you have, what's the energy efficiency. We were being asked in details by one of our tenants, you know, at the Henderson, a lot of questions on energy um, numbers. So they were doing a lot of analysis and calculations before they, you know, obviously we have done the right job and then we have provided, provided them with the uh, right solutions and answers and hence, you know, they signed a contract with us. But what I noticed is that even if I talk to investors um, from time to time, you know, again, the first question is not about your profitability. The first question is, do you have a team and how big is your sustainability team? You know, what are your targets? You know, how 
you know, you know how how often do you review your progress, and when will you be able to achieve, you know, uh, carbon neutrality? So these are the questions that we are getting uh, nowadays. You know, rather than just focusing on profitability. So that's why we have to strike a right balance. At the moment, interest rates are very high. You know, from talking as a from the finance background, it's it's difficult to do business. But at the same time, we have to strike a balance. You know, to you know to um, have the GIVE element, which I mentioned right from the outset, which is green innovation, value for people, and the endeavor for community element in all our projects. If you were to look at all our new commercial and residential projects, you can see GIVE being embedded into every single one of our projects. So, you know, I think that will be uh, the way going forward. So, cost, we are very cautious of that, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we can meet our client and our tenants' needs. Thank you. I mean, one more thing to say on innovative, because I'm thinking about your question. And I, I think, I mean, the biggest innovation would be to finally allow timber or mixed timber structures in, in, in more countries than at the moment. I think it's, it's difficult in Hong Kong, for example. Um, but but to, to look at the structures and, and allow hybrid structures, which is an innovative use of material, both concrete as well as steel in combination with timber, that, that would be... Uh, a very good next move. Ah, you've helped answer your next question. <laughs> um, so for the final question I have for the, the panelists for this section is actually um, when we look to the future, uh, what trends or developments would you want to deploy within your industry that goes towards your own and your industry and company's inspirations and goals for sustainability? I don't know if Sarah, you want to continue with with, with the, the timber I mean, if, if well, no, if what what we, what I would wish for us to do next, I th I think we would love to do um, a reuse, adapt, uh, you know, to, to to have the idea to take a building and then turn it into something else, revamp it with facade and make it better sustainability wise. That could be incredibly in exciting. We haven't done a good museum for years because the cultural sector has going has been not so interested in, 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 in new developments. So a sustainable museum would be great as well. But that's just my... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Damien? Well, when I look at the trends for the future, I would say that you know, it doesn't have certain form. It's more about knowing how to dance with the changes because there will be more changes coming our way and our changes will be escalated by the impacts that we will face by climate. And this is where disruptive thinking comes in, disruptive in innovation comes in. Because it is about changing the mindset of what we are currently doing and it's no longer business as usual. Because for us, after COVID, things have moved and changed certain way business operates. Now with climate, it will be another era, another move that will force us, a lot of companies to change. Because the United Nations have already given the mandate and the 1.5 degree, if we don't meet it, 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 because that is not a political number. It is a cl planetary crisis number. And that is where from UN down to the government, more things will be pressed onto the industry. And this is where, you know, um, from the top level, developers, architects coming down all the way, everyone will be hit and we wouldn't know when. So I think it's about preparing ourselves for changes that we would not expect. And the start is now, the trend of thinking differently, th rethinking the way we operate. Yeah, yeah um, uh, for us, I think the um, green and sustainability will continue to be the key topics. You look at all the panel discussions you know, in Hong Kong or you know, in the region recently, it's always on sustainability. Or there may be some panels on innovations and technology. And that's why I think our focus at Henderson Land will continue to uh, be focusing on uh, sustainability and green. At least this is what our chairman have informed me to focus on. So for now, I think we will continue to work on green buildings, work on health buildings, um, um, and continue to make use of innovations. Um, any final comments or, or, or additions? I mean, I have to fully agree with Damien. We have no other option. Sustainability is no longer an optional item. It, it, it's an absolute must, and we are quite late. That's, I think, the summary. 
foreboding, but with positives. Yeah. One thing I, I want to add, as um, listed companies, there are a lot of uh, reporting requirements. So you can see the um, International Sustainability Standard Board has issued two new standards, you know, S1 and S2, on you know, our sustainability and climate risk. So a lot of companies have to perform physical risk and transition risk analysis, which we have been doing for a long time. But this year, we're taking it even more seriously to go through our entire portfolio of investment properties and assess the climate risk flooding scenario, sea level rise, and so on. So this is a lot of uh, work you know, um, for everyone to take part and to work together to solve the problem. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Johnny, Sarah, and Damien, for your insightful sharing. I think it's wonderful that we've ended on some challenges, um, and that is exactly why we, our next panel discussion will be talking about revolutionizing and the evolution of sustainability through the art industry and through education. So thank you very much for your sharing. Um, and we will now have a slight interval as we transition to the next panel discussion, the art industry's evolution in sustainability. Please do stay tuned. Thank you.
the second session of our Art and Sustainability Forum this morning. Thank you. Okay, a warm welcome to those jo back joining us online. I hope you've been enjoying the exciting and very interesting conversations that have been happening here at the Hong Kong Convention Center. We'll be moving on to our next panel, the art industry's evolution in sustainability. And for this session, I'm delighted to invite Veronica Castillo on stage for, to sh to, for her sharing. Veronica has joined M Plus in 2012, playing a critical role in establishing the museum's foundation of best practices for the long-term preservation, safe display and management of its collections. Veronica oversees four departmental divisions at M+, the archives and library, conservation, exhibitions and display, and registration and collections management. And they're all responsible for caring for and providing access to the museum's collections and loan objects. Veronica is a member of the steering committee for the International Exhibitions Organizers Group and actively represents M Plus at international forums related to collection management, exhibition, and conservation. She currently leads the M Plus Sustainability Steering Committee as well. She has held a wide range of leadership positions at the Museo Reina Sofia in Madrid between 2001 and 2011 and has spearheaded the delivery of the inaugural exhibition program upon the Institute's expansion in 2014. Please join me in welcoming Veronica on stage as her sharing is on Pathways to Sustainability, Unveiling Sustainability and Inclusion Strategies in West Kowloon Cultural District. Welcome, Veronica. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I, first, I wanted to thank the organizers, Francis and Zara and Christis, for having us here today, having been part of this very major initiative. So I'm actually representing the West Kowloon Cultural District, which is one of the major cultural projects in Hong Kong, as potentially most of you will already know. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here to talk about pathways to sustainability for both the district and in plus the museum that I work for. As one of the major cultural projects in Hong Kong, the West Kowloon Cultural District has a mandate to incorporate sustainability across all its activities. As a first step, the district has identified four key pillars of focus, carefully mapped around the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Arts and culture, accessibility, green and economy. As a unique project in Hong Kong with the ambitions to be a place for everyone, the district has the potential to positively influence public awareness around sustainability and become a pioneer on sustainable practices within the cultural sector. The Green Pillar has a focus on infrastructure efficiency, where the district has devoted efforts to ensure that the most sustainable construction practices are applied to the different venues and facilities. One of the key sustainable infrastructures is the district cooling system that uses a consolidated solution that employs seawater to support buildings air conditioning systems. This system can reduce the energy consumption by 20% compared to freshwater cool AC and can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by up to 7,000 tons annually. Our BEAM Plus certified buildings exemplify energy efficiency, and we are committed to further enhancing their performance by introducing more productive optimization practices reducing carbon emissions. The infrastructure is also inclusive of renewable and energy solutions, such as solar panels, rainwater harvesting systems, and solar hot water systems. On the social sustainability aspect, the authority focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and makes extensive efforts to improve access to all the content and venues, as well as boosting the engagement with people with disabilities, with the aim to provide a more inclusive experience for all. It has been proven that the art and culture sector can contribute to a more diversified economy. In relation to financial sustainability, the authority has received a first of its kind $4 billion sustainability-linked loan that encompasses environmental and social impact targets. Arts and culture is obviously a key pillar of our business and activity of the district. 
and devotes efforts towards strengthening community engagement and audience cultivation in ways that are meaningful and can support a broader awareness of the sustainability topics. An example is the Arts Impact Fellowship managed by the Performing Arts Division to support pioneering research that inspire change. Now I'm gonna go into a bit of more detail and talk about the work that has happened at M Plus, the Museum of Visual Culture. M oh, sorry, I'm just seeing something there. Uh, M Plus initiated its sustainability journey well before it opened its doors. The topic was identified as one of the four major pillars of focus for the substitution as early as 2017. In 2021, with a more mature and robust team, we define a sustainability vision, aiming to lead by example to influence change in the sector and the region. When defining that vision, we identified seven milestones and intentions to kickstart our work. To become a role model, to be an advocate, to be experimental, trustworthy, to ensure that we could embed trust and sustainability within, to become a platform for collaboration and to give back. We also defined four major work streams, collections care, visitor engagement, staff engagement, and travel and shipping. Through the work of all these work streams and the sustainability steering group, and the advocates across the organization, we have developed a number of actions in each of these areas, starting with quick, the quick win first, and now developing more in-depth content and actions as we mature as an operating organization. For collection care and display, we looked across standard museum practices and optimized all our resources. Here you have some examples of activities that we've been carrying about, like, for example, standardizing our framing, or working to reuse our crates and convert them into furniture, and so on. For visitor engagement, obviously, is one of our key pillars because we are a public organization and we understand the strength that that means to reach out to broader audiences. So we engage actively with audiences and communities and work in close collaborations with others too in the cultural sector and also work on cultural retail, as you can see there too. Staff engagement was a key thing for us to do as we were evolving as an organization and growing within. We have it as embedded as to understand that the whole sustainability effort was a grassroots sustainability effort because we got advocates in all departments that were coming up with the ideas of what we could do and how we could implement all these things that you're seeing here. Obviously it had been already a top-down mandate through a vision but we work very, very closely through the teams. And they are the ones that actually act as catalyzers of the conversation. Travel and shipping is obviously one of the hot topics in the museum and gallery sector at the moment. So at M Plus, we have been making conscious decisions towards reducing the couple footprint related to artwork movement. But we also work on public activities. Public engagement is key to our vision. So we embed sustainability in many of our programs. We showcase artists whose work has sustainability impact, generating public programs in collaboration with other cultural organizations and creating thought-provoking events like the Beijing Cardboard Series that we did with the Hong Kong Ballet. And we ensure that sustainability percolates through all of different public activities. For example, with this dedicated uh, cinema edition, Thinking Global and Acting Local. Ecology and Film, who was presented last spring. We also strive to generate an impact as wide as possible by collaborating with well-established brands like Prada to amplify our reach and showcase relevant discussions for a diversified public in key moments like the International Art Week in Hong Kong in March. Within the museum sector, M Plus is a key contributor to the global discussions by participating actively in several international initiatives like the Sustainability Toolkit developed by the CMAM, part of ICOM, being a member of the Gallery Climate Coalition, and participating in the review of the Bissell Green Protocol towards sustainable collection care and exhibition practices within the museum sector. I hope this brief presentation can showcase the importance of the topic for our institution, and I will be more than happy to dive further on any of the initiatives as part of the panel discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, Veronica. Next, I'd like to invite Betty Ng on stage. Betty is a registered architect in the Netherlands, a Reba Chartered Architect in the United Kingdom, and associate member of the AIA in the United States. She is also the mastermind behind Christie's new APEC headquarters at the Henderson, and is currently an adjunct associate professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, co-teaching master architecture design studio with collective directors, Qi Chen Yan and Yuan Minguez. She has previously served as a visiting professor at architecture at the National University of Singapore, the adjunct adjunct assistant professor at the CUHK advising master thesis and assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong. Betty is currently a committee member of Reba Hong Kong chapter, member of the International Women's Forum, board director at Harvard Club Hong Kong, and board member of the Cornell Club of Hong Kong. Prior to setting up the collective, Betty was design director at OMA Rotterdam, Asia, and New York, having also practiced at Her Herzog and De Mirong and Basel. And her topic this morning is a new era of environmental awareness in arts and architecture. Welcome, Betty. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, before I start the presentation, um, I would very much like to uh, first credit our team at Collective. Um, whatever I'm going to present today represents a collective effort uh, of also our clients and the experts that we have been working for years together with our team. So I will first start with um, the three pillar concept of sustainability that hopefully a lot of you uh, uh, know about. Um, it's all about the balance between the environment, the economy and society. And today my presentation will try to uh, talk about projects that how we struggle and successfully balance these three. So the first project I would like to share uh, is actually a Grade A office twin tower project uh, that is currently under construction for new world development. Um, our scope of work is actually uh, the podium, the commercial podium that encompasses um, the landscape and also um, a flexible program that is under the feature steps that connects the two podium together for a new public space. Um, so the intention indeed is biophilic. There is already uh, a green hill behind the site. Uh, what we wanted to do is to erase that boundary between the built and what is already there to create a green landscape uh, that is also available to the use of the public. So this image is actually uh, taken a month ago uh, and you can see a resemblance very closely to what we have envisioned. Uh, and this is a site uh, picture from uh, around a year ago. And currently, uh, we have had uh, construction going on uh, quite, quite smoothly, and hopefully it will open uh, mid next year. So apart from having this public space, um, apart from having this public spaces that was uh, intended to use for, for public, um, the program actually uh, underneath the feature steps uh, is a two-tier auditorium. And this two-tier auditorium, um, the intention is to create an ultra-flexible space uh, for the company uh, that can host events, their own board meeting, but at the same time to be completely open uh, for the use of any events possible or even exhibitions. So with, with all these kind of design elements uh, putting in, before this building was even built, we were very fortunate to be recognized by um, LEED, um, Beam Plus, and we actually achieved a Well Platinum uh, Award. So uh, this is currently uh, what it looks like on site. Uh, we're very, very excited uh, to see this happening. It, looks, it really looks uh, very much like the concept image that we have made. So the second project I would like to share uh, is the Tala Asia Media Headquarters. Um, it was uh, situated in Wong Hang, again, right in front of a very green hill. So uh, one idea was when we planned the office, around 30% of the space were used for um, open spaces, uh, which we created a garden with a 20 meter long uh, internal garden that, uh, again, trying to bring the green into uh, interior spaces, uh, which at the same time, uh, 
uh, it acts as a flexible event space for toddler to host uh, their private events. Uh, which at the same time, uh, we have uh, also looked very deep into the comfort of the employees implementing a very well double layer glass acoustic for interior meeting room purpose and also acoustic panel on the ceiling, uh, creating a very um, soft but formal area for meetings and uh, office work to happen. So these two projects uh, definitely check all the boxes. Um, biophilic design, we got all these certification. Uh, as Sarah uh, previously also have shared, this is the basic responsibility for an architect nowadays. Uh, what I would like to bring today uh, to share, uh, also apart from being a practitioner, but also as an academic, is that sustainability for me personally is the ability to continue over a long period of time. It's not necessarily about the greening, it's not necessarily about the recycling. So what I would like to advocate or share, uh, and I might be completely wrong, but at least I put forth an idea that uh, I would like to share, is that sustainability has a lot to do with the idea of continuity. And the idea of continuity uh, means the balance between environment, economy, and so the society. So uh, one project I would like to show uh, is the Art Intelligence Global uh, Office, which encompasses uh, an art gallery. The, the thing about this project is from the outside, you don't really feel like uh, it's any project that is about sustainability. But apart from the office, uh, deep inside the space, there is an art gallery. And this is actually the hinge wall that closed off the art gallery from the office. And what um, was very special for us is uh, the brief was asking to um, perform a, to do an art gallery that can actually uh, use very little materials, which means um, there will be a, no more loop of construction and demolition of new partition walls when you uh, create a new exhibition. Hence, we decided to create a machine a tool that allows this to happen. Uh, there is a what we call a rotatable art wall, which is six meter wide and four meter tall, uh, that will also shift back and forth in space in one direction, and it will also rotate 360 degree uh, in any direction you like. And because it's rotatable, uh, you can also rotate the wall uh, along the axis of the beam and create partitions uh, for any art exhibition to take place. And together with the system of the two hinge walls that encloses the office, uh, we managed to create a variety of floor plan. Um, the client has managed to do around four to five exhibitions without building a single wall, without demolishing a single wall. And we think this is our little experiment, hopefully to contribute to the art environment uh, in you know, building exhibitions. But of course, uh, we do a lot of exhibition design, and we are part of the culprit uh, in creating uh, so-called waste. Uh, however, I think um, cultural sustainability is also a very important point of view when you look at exhibition making. That um, exhibition actually allows uh, culture and heritage to continue and to be uh, introduced to the world. However, we do do a lot of uh, bespoke, let's say, pedestals and art display. Uh, and as I said, we are definitely one of of the culprit. Um, but then uh, during the course of design back in 2017, uh, we have decided to take uh, two rooms in the five rooms that we have designed uh, with a uh, agenda of reusability. So in one of the rooms about industrialization and craftsmanship, uh, we have introduced a hardware that you probably have seen everywhere, extruded aluminum um, structure, to create a series of vitrines uh, that allows for four different heights and levels and these are completely reusable. Uh, and moving on forward, we have also designed a full storage system and a display system for the Archigram collection. Uh, hence that this system can be used for storage purpose and also for display purpose. Um, one project that I would love to talk on is about the failure of a sustainability agenda that we have. Uh, it's actually for the Taipei Biennale. Uh, we were very lucky to be working with um, the, the late Bruno Latour uh, and uh, a young upcoming curator, uh, Martin Gernand, uh, on creating a main piece for the Biennale called New Diplomatic Encounters, which is an installation uh, used for uh, workshops and lectures to happen. Um, the principle is four different heights. It is a continuous table that has a height of a stool, 
of a chair, of a table, and a counter, and it allows a variation of uh, activities to happen. Um, more intimate ones, more private ones, workshops, such and forth. Uh, I particularly love this image because it also allows you to not really participate in the talk, but to sit very far away uh, observing. Um, this beautiful objects, we love this very, very much, but it encompasses a big failure of a sustainable strategy that we presented, which is uh, the idea of d the double B, better of the life and a biodegradable material. Uh, the reason uh, that we didn't manage to actually um, work on this, two basic idea. One is to create a structure, a scaffolding that can be reused, uh, and also to use a recycled material as a surface was because of cost. So uh, you can see that uh, this is actually an agenda and a system that we have designed, that uh, all the legs for the material can be reused as table and chairs, uh, which will fit perfectly the agenda in the museum because they create a lot of lectures and workshop. So, um, you know, the the picture here show a beautiful object and uh, we're very happy with the project. However, it is indeed a very interesting way to look at sustainability because as I mentioned, it's all about the balance of the environment, economy and society and this economy prevailed. Um, however, um, I wanted to also present uh, a few more uh, ideas that, uh, apart from being an architect, uh, we also do a lot of uh, installation. So this is a doodle neon tree that we have created for Upper House. And of course, in your mind, you will think, how does that relate to sustainability? Uh, one of the reasons is because we were extremely intrigued by the idea of being asked to do a sustainable tree when it's a temporary exhibition, and that the tree will probably um, you know, be stocked up somewhere you, you will never see again. So um, we wanted to uh, put the idea of sustainability in another light, which we look very close into the idea of heritage and cultural sustainability, uh, very much um, advocated by, uh, by the UN. So what we did was we look local, Hong Kong. Um, everyone knows this Im image and the neon sign very well, and you must be aware that they are all getting uh, dismantled. Uh, M plus themselves is a huge advocate in collecting all these neon signs, uh, but then two very close friends of mine run this nonprofit organization, Street Sign Hong Kong. Um, they are architects, but this is uh, their side job because they're passionate about it. They actually go, um, participate in the dismantling, and then they um, meticulously wrap up every single neon tube. Uh, this neon tube has been sitting under typhoon, rain, sunlight for the last 20 decades. Neon is actually one of the most durable and sustainable signage uh, you, have, you can ever see in this world. And every single neon is actually handmade. So uh, our team got very interested in it. We have to sort of uh, do a crash course on neon making. We went to uh, Master Wu Jigai, who is probably one of the very few remaining master neon um, in Hong Kong. And uh, I was really trying to do it. It was completely difficult. One of the reasons is because neon is completely analog and extremely two-dimensional. It is impossible to almost make a three-dimensional neon uh, purely because neon is based on a flat blueprint. So we start to run a bunch of uh, research and analysis, and we were also a bit um, overwhelmed by our own sketch because we promised to deliver this doodle tree uh, to the upper house. So what we did is we make use of technology. We digitalize the model, we make it three-dimensional, and we discuss with uh, Wu, Wu Master uh, how can we make this happen. So it will completely be a prototype that uh, Mr. Wu will have to look with his eyes to make use of his eye-hand coordination and fully based on his own experience to create this tree one tube each by hand. Uh, so here I want to show a uh, very quick um, video to let you understand how difficult it is actually is to create this doodle tree.
So starting from this project, I would have to say this is almost like a passion project, uh, as you can see. We have been advocating a lot on the idea of cultural and heritage sustainability, uh, doing a lot of talks. And here we have uh, Iko Yokoyama from M Plus uh, participate in this uh, very important talk we had, trying to uh, make people understand that sustainability is not necessarily just about greenwashing. And uh, this story doesn't end here. In the end, this tree, um, our own office purchased it. And we uh, meticulously wrap every single uh, neon tube up, uh, ho hoping to find a second life for it. So we documented every single tube. And we participated in a recent competition at, um, uh, at Daigun uh, to um, do a neon-related sculpture. Uh, so what we did is we um, create characteristics and clusters uh, of these neon tubes uh, and hang them in different locations, uh, connecting uh, the parade ground to the prison yard throughout the whole journey. Unfortunately, we lost the competition, um, but we're very happy to say we're already looking at the third life of the possibility of these neons, uh, very likely trying to uh, either find someone who wants to do an installation uh, or we create a series of uh, design objects through it. So um, I know I'm running a bit out of time. Uh, it's a little long, sorry. But I have a very important message that I would really much like to share is, again, sustainability is indeed the ability to continue over a long period of time. I think one of the really great examples in Hong Kong would definitely be Daigun. Um, I'm very fortunate to be working with uh, one of the architects um, who has worked at Herschel and Dumiron for 10 years building this project, Chi Yen. She is currently a director and collective, also uh, a project lead uh, for the Christie's project. Um, her expertise on such has really uh, taught us a lot uh, as a team of architects uh, being implemented in this particular project that we have worked on uh, inside Daigun. This project is very dear to us uh, because it's a very, very small size project but it's extremely difficult to work on. It's extremely meticulous. We have to submit every single drawing to antique and monument office. There's not a single wall, floor, and ceiling that you can put a new screw in. And uh, we were asked to design a luxury uh, fine dining um, restaurant. So here you can see that we have uh, actually uh, injected uh, a lot of uh, beautiful feature, but what you didn't know is Every single one of them is functional. So the flute at the wall are actually uh, acoustic panels. Uh, and on the upper part of it, those are perforated panels uh, to contain air conditioning. No single screws can be, new screws can be screwed on the ceiling, so we have to cantilever all the lights from the wall. Uh, because of uh, the, the hardness of the floor, uh, we can't do new floors. In terms of acoustic, we printed the same marble material on the carpet uh, for acoustic purpose. And of course, the hardest thing is actually, how do you build doors? So we have to build a door jam that is uh, completely following the silhouette of the columns. So, the most sustainable thing in our industry is not to build. 40% of solid waste is actually generated uh, during building constru construction and demolition. And uh, today I would like to uh, resonate with what Sarah has mentioned before and to uh, present a book that I read, a project done by other architects uh, in Belgium, 51 and 4 Yi. The topic is how to not demolish a building. Um, the project is about how to reuse a two twin tower by retaining their core, retaining 60% of the building mass, and to re, um, rebuild a floor slab with different heights for flexibility purpose. So this is a, a YouTube, uh, um, lecture that you can actually uh, look into. Uh, it's a very interesting lecture, uh, and I would uh, suggest everyone to take a look into it. So today my takeaway is so-called the new era uh, for architecture and art in terms of sustainability, in my opinion, is to sustain, to preserve, uh, and to find new use. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, I apologize for our overrunning. <laughs> Thank you, Betty. Very enthusiastic indeed. Um, our next speaker are, is Francis Bilan, uh, president of Christie's Asia Pacific. Based in Hong Kong, Francis has been the president of Christie's Asia Pacific since January 2019. In his leadership role, Francis manages all Asia Pacific based teams, including the regional offices, and is accountable for all transactions made by Asia based collectors globally across live, online, and private sales. 
Under Francis's helm, Christie's Asia Pacific has established a series of milestones and record-breaking results. In particular, Francis is overseeing the Christie's landmark initiative to relocate its APAC headquarters to the Henderson in 2024, a major new building in Hong Kong's central business hub. Francis has 17 years of experience in premium and luxury consumer goods. He joined Christie's in 2016 as Global Managing Director Asian Art from his previous role with Swarovski, overseeing their businesses in Asia Pacific. Francis began his career in management consulting at McKinsey and Co. in Europe and Asia. He is a member of the Board of Advisors for Kids Earth Fund in Japan and serves on various boards as non-executive chairman and independent non-executive director. Today, Francis will be sharing with us on rethinking approaches to sustainability in the art business. Francis Fleets. Thank you. Betty, I think we're going to do like carbon footprint, you know, we can offset. So I will give you some of my speaking time. I'm going to be quick. Sorry about that. No. Very passionate. Thank you for sharing all this. Uh, what I wanted to do before we walk into the panel is to talk a little bit about numbers, uh, because there's a lot of concepts, there's ideas, there's initiative, but at the end of the day, uh, as we say in, uh, in, in, in leadership positions, is you get what you measure. Uh, so what we did in, in 2000, in 2000, before 2021, we actually looked at the carbon footprint of uh, Christie's globally across our activities. Uh, so we hired, we worked, we partnered with some consultants, and we looked at so how many carbon, how many tons of carbon are, are we actually talking about? And, and by doing that exercise, it had been incredibly enlightening for us to understand actually where, what are the major source of carbon and start to devise uh, activities and plans that we can specifically target uh, these, uh, these reductions. So uh, here I am uh, sharing with you that, that we, we emitted in 2019 um, we have an in-scope and out-scope. I'm not going to get into this. You can refer to the sustainability report of Christie's for more detail. But in-scope, we have emitted in 2019 53 uh, k of uh, carbon dioxide, and we are down to 33 last year uh, in, uh, in 2022. 20, uh, so we managed to reduce by 40%, which I think is a, is a great achievement. Uh, what we committed in 2021 is actually to reduce by half and to offset the other, the other half with, uh, with uh, carbon uh, certificates, I think we might be able by 2030 to, uh, to actually reduce uh, even further our emission. I think it's quite notable to uh, realize that we have reduced by 40% in 2022 when it was actually one of our most profitable year and one of the most active year in the, the art world with 8.4 billion uh, US dollars being uh, sold. Now, how do we break that down into, uh, into buckets? A couple of things I'm going to share, which I'm sure are going to surprise all of you as much as it surprised me. We've been talking about buildings. So obviously, building is, is an important part of uh, our emissions. Buildings, and we include into buildings commuting from our staff, is 11%. Okay? It's not a third. It's not half. It's 11%. We've managed uh, since 2019, so 1922, managed to reduce our building emissions by 61% and I get into some of the initiatives that we had. Um, even small and is actually publishing. We used to have catalogs, I don't even talk about it now. We have Jill, our global head of marketing here. She goes, yes, you know, we got, almost got rid of catalog minus 84%. Uh, billing is 3.7 K-ton, publishing is 0.7 K-ton, 2%. The second biggest one, uh, the, 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 above building, we have travel. Our staff travel, our specialists travel around the world, they travel within the region, they go see collectors, they look, go look at objects, that's 18%. So it's, we spend, we, it's almost twice as much in, in travel than we do uh, just by having our building, including the commuting of our staff. Above that, we have not moving people, we have moving objects. 20% is on shipping. We ship paintings, we ship ceramics, a lot of the objects that you see here may be coming from collectors in Hong Kong, but a lot of them actually are coming from somewhere else. We tour these objects also across uh, different geographies to be able to show them to collectors. So shipping is 20% of our emissions. Now, if you add up all this, there's 50% left. I bet anyone in this room is not able to guess what this 50% is. At 50% is IT. It's IT. Data center, uh, e-waste, you name it. 
uh, it could be you know uh, our on-chain activities that we have uh, selling NFTs and so on. And I think it's uh, what was particularly uh, enlightening for me going through that report is to realize that this is for us the biggest challenge. For all the others that I named before, that before shipping minus 55, publishing minus 84, building minus 61, uh, business travel minus 56, some of them went massively down during the, the COVID time and they picked up a little bit as you know we went back to a more normal activity, but they're all massively reduced compared to where we were in 2019, all but one IT. So I wanted to share this with you. Uh, if anyone in the room or online is able to come to us with even more uh, solutions. Now we're working on, on these things. I have an opportunity later to share some of uh, the initiatives that we have. Uh, I had another two minutes of uh, speaking time, which I gracefully offer to, uh, to Betty. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Francis. If I can invite Francis to remain on stage and invite our other two panelists, Betty and Veronica, to join us for our panel discussion. Thank you. Um, so our discussion will be on the art industry evolution and sustainability. And for the first part, I'd like to speak a little bit about revolutionizing the art industry through um, this important topic. Sustainability, as we all know, isn't a static concept. And through everyone's sharing, we see it's rather a journey that continually evolves, especially in the dynamic world of art. Having heard about the respective developments in sustainability in public and governmental organizations, auction houses, and Betty in your dual role as both a private architect firm and educator, I'm curious to hear your unique uh, perspectives on the sustainability evolution within your own sectors. Um, perhaps you can provide some anecdotes or personal invite insights that might illuminate this journey. And perhaps I can invite Veronica to start first. Thank you. Um, indeed, uh, sustainability is very evolving. I was actually having a talk to Zara before uh, talking about how 25 years ago no one was really talking about it, uh, not for construction, nor for the art sector at all. Um, in my own personal experience, I was trained as a conservator, um, and at the time, keeping the very, very strict parameters to maintain artworks forever was actually a big topic. So it was all based on science, of course, but the expectation was that buildings were going to work really hard to maintain the very strict environmental parameters. So I'm very pleased to have seen through my career an evolution of the thinking that has come given by, of course, new scientific evidence, which is always good, but also due to other pressures which are external to all of us but are like the economy, for example, you know, when museums can't handle um, sustaining the cost, uh, they become more energy efficient and therefore they adapt to practices. So I feel that, you know, our sector is evolving quite rapidly in the past few years on understanding that we can still have long-term preservation of collections while adapting the efficiency of our buildings. And so from my personal experience, I think this is actually a fabulous thing to be going through, you know, to become more specific and a lot more efficient, but is still maintaining uh, the longevity of our collections for future generations, which is also to do with your topic of continuity. Uh, Francis? Well, I think it's, uh, it was a, a growing, it's of course a growing topic outside, and um, when we started to, when we decided in 2019 to uh, change our strategy and to move away from that model where we operate in uh, Central, a small gallery, and our offices, plus the convention center, uh, twice a year, and we wanted to have our own cell room, just like London, uh, New York, Paris uh, do have. We started to look at buildings, locations, because we have very specific criteria. And then just going through the exercise of what do we need? We need high ceiling height. We need large uh, floor plate with no pillar. We need to have practically uh, ground floor access so that people can come in and out of our evening cell easily. Uh, so we have all these things which are very technical things uh, for Christie's. And then we, we took a step back and said, what is one... Um, and, and, and just taking a bigger picture of all this, we really wanted to add sustainability because it was becoming increasingly important to, to us. I think we all custodian of something. We, we see us, ourselves at Christie's as um, serving collectors. Collectors are custodian of objects, you know, uh, 
these objects have gone through generations, decades, uh, centuries, uh, thanks to their collector, and they survive even if uh, the individual collectors don't stay. Uh, so we support this in what we do, uh, so that art is, you know, continues to be taken care of. We're also a custodian of the art market. You know, we are like the, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. We make sure that you know, bonds are being priced, but we make sure that things are being priced. We have a duty to make sure that there's fluidity, liquidity in the market. Well, we're also a custodian of uh, Earth as, you know, responsible company and organization, and I think that's uh, the role we also see ourselves uh, having to play, and it's uh, building into a lot of the things that we do now. Uh, we're delighted to actually have this forum um, because it was so central to our move to the Anderson, but it had become also so central to uh, what we do at Christie's and the way we are trying to reinvent um, the way we operate across multi multiple uh, touch points. And I think, as I said in my opening remark, what I find what I find daunting but also very exciting is just it touches everything. There's, there's nothing you do not have, you have to touch every single part of the business to be able to make it. You won't be able just, you can't tweak it. You know, it's not tweaking, you really have to reinvent. Betty? I promise I'll keep this short. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think apart from, of course I'm, I'm no expert uh, in this topic of sustainability. Uh, I'm a practitioner that participate heavily in it. Um, today, I'm aware that uh, we will receive a lot of insights in terms of the quantitative methodology from all the experts that we have listened to. Hence, I thought it was important for me as a practitioner, but also as uh, a representative from the academics, to offer uh, a little bit of a different insight in terms of qualitative sustainability. Uh, and our focus has a lot to do with culture and heritage. Uh, and that is something I personally feel very important about. Uh, hence, uh, I think that I, I have no, let's say, uh, particular insights. I don't have any antidote for this. But uh, I do have uh, a voice uh, with the practice that we run, trying to show that uh, it is actually more than numbers. Numbers are by default what we need to achieve, uh, but there's also a qualitative side to it, which I hope uh, today we can start thinking more about that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Francis, you mentioned some challenges and progress with regards to sustainability at Christie's and within the art industry. Perhaps you can share a little bit about um, where are the challenges are and where the progress uh, we have made. So if I go through some of the blocks that I was referring to um, in earlier, on the, on the building side, I think there's obvious choices we need to make to go uh, into whenever we are relocating, tweak where we are or relocating into buildings which are the standard as the, that the Henderson land aspires to and the Henderson has. Um, and it has to do with energy efficiency and that's really in the way the building is being designed. And now, when, what we put, when we report building, we also put commuting. Uh, and that's why it starts to be interesting because it's a much bigger discussion than how, how do you go to the office? You know, do you take the MTR, do you take your car, and you know, do we ask staff to take your bicycle? I'm a cyclist myself. I don't necessarily advise anyone to go to the office every day uh, with a bike. But then that comes into work from home. So what is our policy, what, are, what is our posture when it comes to supporting uh, our staff uh, to actually work from home, be closer to their family or the, you know, their kids or the elderly, and just limiting the amount of uh, time that they spend in transportation. So that's on, on, the, on, the, on the building side. Publishing, as I said, is only 2% today, minus 84% compared to 2019. We basically have decided that we would massively uh, uh, go away from catalogs. Um, they take, they have a very high footprint when it comes to printing these catalogs, but an even higher one when you move them around, because we ship these catalogs to, to clients and collectors around the world. Uh, so that was kind of the, the, the easy ones. On uh, shipping, uh, so shipping objects, I think somewhere uh, low-hanging fruits and easy ones. I saw that that's uh, what you guys are doing at M+. So we move from uh, uh, air freight to sea freight. Not only is it uh, cheaper, but it's also, uh, it has a much lower uh, carbon footprint. The only downside is, you know, if you have to move a painting, we're very fast-paced at Christie's. If you have to move a painting uh, quickly, I don't think the ships are quick enough. But there's a, a fair amount of things that we can ship around if we 
you know, get a collection of wine from Europe and we sell it in Hong Kong and we have a few weeks to actually arrange for shipping. There's no point in putting this um, in the plane. Um, together with shipping, we have packaging. So we spoke about reusable packagings. Each of the objects that we sell are quite unique in size, in shape. So do we have each and every time to build a specific crate? Uh, so that's the kind of question that we're asking ourselves. We're working with that collective of galleries also to try to find a better solution in that respect. Uh, and think back in the days, you didn't have containers. And everybody thinks like 80% of shipping, except bulk, is actually containers. And nobody challenges that we use containers. So at some point, someone needs to come up with, well, this is the standard. This is the way it's going to be. And I think we're going to get there. Um, what I find challenging in, uh, in what we do is, uh, is a bit of, uh, what's that game, whack a -mole? So you kind of push one down and the other one pops up. So, you know, of course we don't, we don't print catalogs anymore, but what, why, you know, what do we do? There's a massive transformation digitally at Christie's in the past few years, uh, heavily supported by COVID, uh, which means that we're able with uh, different platforms to do the two things that we do. First one is to present objects. We explain, we exp you know, we explain what's coming up for sale. Uh, and we excite collectors to actually consider acquiring them. And the second thing is we help them transact. Uh, so it's basically the auction room here. 80% um, of bids at Christie's in the first half of this year were placed online. So all that is great. You know, we're very proud of digital transformation. We had 32 million people dialing into um, our live streaming in Asia last year through multiple platforms and so on. But then when I look at, you know, so you push one down, which is the catalog, and then you have the IT, the IT footprint actually comes up uh, on the other side. Uh, so I think that's one of the challenge, is that you can't just, we're experimenting, so we touch one side and you see that the other actually is getting more complicated. We did do, uh, we have a, a number of initiatives um, for we to address uh, that side of, uh, of things in IT. We've moved uh, a lot of our data into the cloud, which uh, has reduced by uh, some 20 plus percent the, the, the footprint per, per megabyte. Um, we have uh, moved, uh, you know, we use Ethereum and Christie's uh, 3.0, uh, which, which has uh, changed from a certain type of proof to another type of proof, so it's, it's more effective. So we're working on it. But what we face also when it comes to IT, because your question was about challenges, some of the blocks in IT, uh, we have data uh, integrity uh, questions. So we don't, we're not quite sure, is that the real number? You know, how can we be sure that the data we're working with, with is actually the, the real ones? So just sharing. Uh, surprisingly, in two, three years, some incredibly fast uh, change that we've seen and others where, well, there's obviously a lot of uh, hard work to be done. Thank you, Francis, for that. Um, Veronica, thank you for sharing both the West Kowloon District and the M Plus initiatives. Um, and as you said, you're also chairing the steering committee on sustainability. So from the perspective of M Plus, what are some of the initiatives that the museum has taken on this topic um, in relation to acquisitions, exhibitions, and public education projects? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, well, as we all know, M Plus is actually a very new um, endeavor. Uh, we are only operational for about two years now. But as soon as we started, and as I mentioned in my talk, prior to even prior to opening, we were already very conscious that the our world needs to start looking at sustainability very seriously. And we wanted to embed it into our operationals from the get-go. Um, so apart from starting with the vision that I mentioned and starting to get grassroots um, support from our own colleagues to come up with ideas of how to be more sustainable, we very quickly started to look into, for example, extending the duration of our exhibitions. Uh, you know, the Arbol has been doing rotating exhibitions of three months durations for years. So just starting with that principle, which is a simple one to take, but actually takes you quite far, uh, and reducing your cover footprint was a good example of one thing we were doing. We also looked into reducing rotations within our exhibitions and so not changing works all the time. We are working very closely with the international community on understanding the environmental conditions and how we can experiment to be a little more fluid within the requirements and achieve um, the efficiency of our buildings. Uh, we work on um, research and trying to look into ecology as part of 
how we approach our acquiring, our, our exhibition uh, programming. So that's also a big part of what we do. I put some of the examples that you saw in my presentation around standardizing or framing to make sure that you're not doing waste. We started to work very closely with vendors, both for production, but also for logistics. And I start kind of having the conversation with them too, um, because as part of the influence of a public institution is that you can actually engage widely with the sector and try and implement that change, having conversation about what are you doing with the waste for an exhibition or, you know, and you give us a carbon footprint um, kind of calculation of what it means to ship. Um, we already have, as we mentioned and you just mentioned, um, have this thinking of um, green first, please. So looking into logistics and starting with, can we do it by sea? Is it possible? And of course, in multiple times, it's not possible. But just asking the question as the first go, it's already putting you on that mindset which is really important. So I think there is multiple little things that you can do. We focus on the low hanging fruit, as um, Francis was saying, to start with, because you have to start somewhere. And as soon as you start in introducing these initiatives, your whole team goes behind it. That's when our installation team came and said, oh, you know what, we're gonna make furniture for a workshop out of crates. Because they had the thinking already, because we had been talking about it. So I think the message here is more about there's a lot that can be done, and it doesn't need to be all grandiose. And you know, we're seeing all these major infrastructure projects, and it's fascinating to see the architects and developers are having sustainability at the core. Uh, but what can we do as an institution? We can do public programs, we can create workshops, and we can talk to the public and get them to engage with the topics, or you know, like the carbon, um, the carbon, um, uh, sorry, event that we did with the Hong Kong Ballet. People were very surprised there was some, something happening in the museum, you know, like dance happening. But what is this dance about? It's about the carbon footprint. Um, so you can do lots of little things uh, and create a big ripple effect. Um, so that's what we've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Very much looking forward to more of these events happening at, at M Plus and at West Kowloon. Um, that leads me very easily on to the second part of our conversation, which is on educating and inspiring the future. Um, and engaging with the community is obviously a key pillar of sustainability, often sparking truly transformative initiatives like you just shared. Um, and to Betty, education is such a powerful tool in shaping a sustainable future. And in your role as professional professor um, at Chinese University. How does sustainability feature academically within the curriculum for these students? Um, I guess one of the reasons that I was very enthusiastic uh, with this summit uh, was the passion to address this urgency of also to let our younger generation understand the idea of sustainability is really more than greenwashing. It's more than uh, biophilic. Of course, that's extremely important. Uh, but that nowadays, as a practicing architect, is our default. We have to address uh, the certification. We have to address the numbers. Uh, the quantitative analysis is extremely important. But that sets a very good foundation uh, for the young people to understand that there is also the soft power of sustainability in terms of culture, heritage, and uh, all these kind of softness in terms of the intangible elements uh, of sustainability. So. Um, I, I, I think, you know, right now in the university, uh, in terms of the curriculum, um, the idea of studying the technology, uh, the quantitative analysis are very well uh, inputted. Um, our role as uh, design professors, uh, running design studios with students, has a lot to do with inspiring them to think out of this already a box, the box of numbers. Um, so that is uh, something that myself, uh, Chi and Juan, our directors, we co-teach studios together in Chinese University. Um, and it's something that we share very heavily, how to inspire younger minds to understand is more than just greening, more than just calculation, uh, more than uh, technological advancement, which again, they're very important. Uh, but then there is also this aspect of softness that we need to inject uh, in terms of designing. Thank you. Um, from educating students to educating your teams and educating at Christie's, um, Francis, you've been a great advocate in changing the way Christie's does business here in Asia, especially in our transition to a permanent collection. Um, how do you empower the team here at Christie's uh, around sustainability? 
Well, they all know I don't do much. <laughs> I'm waiting for something very inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, the, and we have a lot of our staff that probably are listening, and, and I, hopefully they, they're not going to come to see me afterwards and say, what did you say? It's not the way we, we work. Uh, that changed. So first and foremost, it started with that commitment to the Pledge 2030, which came from Guillaume CEO, Guillaume Sauti, our CEO, uh, and with a very strong support from our shareholder, uh, the Pinot family, who is also very, very you know, dedicated to, to this. Um, then, when it came to us in Asia, that change of uh, strategy in terms of cell room was fundamental. So it's not, this is the, not the most sustainable way to operate, because we build this for two weeks, every six months. 80% uh, of what we have here, by the way, of the elements are reused uh, for a number of seasons. So we, we try the best we can to actually limit the footprint of this, but this is not the best. Um, I could see they were itching to maybe tell more about how, how our space is going to look like, uh, but you're not allowed to because <laughs> we have to get you all back you know, in a few months when we're sharing how this, this space is being um, designed for the Anderson. But I think that that whole project of the Anderson has sparkled uh, a, a, a very deep change within our organization in Asia on how we work and how we operate. Um, and there is a lot of questions, uh, you know, like uh, work from home versus uh, working in the office. Uh, do we need to have all these papers around? You'd be surprised, but when we looked at the number of paper that anybody who's actually coming to bid here, the number of paper that needs to be signed or filled, we have how many, five, six? Uh, to look at order, it was, it was terrible, and we could all just limit to one, assuming we still use paper and we're not happy with it because we wish we could, we could even move to iPad. So the way we've, we've managed that project is, of course, there's the big question of how is the space going to be designed and all the macro decisions need to be made around the investment and so on. But we have created, uh, I think, about 12 work streams um, within the organization from the design of our cell calendar to moving to being paperless to uh, like, um, you know, outside warehousing and so on. And I think uh, there is one thread also across all these work streams is, of course, the need to be more sustainable. And each and every one of these work streams uh, is fully staffed actually by Christie's uh, staff. And we have probably half, more than half of the organization um, in uh, Hong Kong, which one way or another is in one of these work streams. So at, at heart, what I have in that transformation is that it's just not a top-down thing. It's ultimately a transformation in the way we operate in, uh, in Asia and serve our collectors that will be owned by each and every one of our staff. And no one can come in two years to me to say, I didn't know. I say, of course you knew, because you were part of that transformation. And, and I think it's also, I'm saying it as a, as a bit of a joke, but what I'm absolutely amazed with is the, the amount of um, creativity, innovation, um, that actually comes from that uh, bottom-up process being owned by the, uh, the organization, which, which I think is ultimately how you, you fully anchor the values that we want to live uh, with. Thank you. And it does tie in very strongly with the earlier panel when they talked about the need for community and everyone to be moving in the right direction. Um, operationally, uh, Veronica, you, you were mentioning how museums globally, sustainability is obviously kind of a key proponent and key focuses. And as representative of Asia's key kind of cultural institution here, you actively participate in international museums and forums as well. Um, from your experience and from the different panels you've, you've taken part in, uh, could you please share maybe what some of the most advanced practices or plans are related to sustainability across global museums? Yes, of course, thank you. Um, I think that's one of the key parts of being part of a major cultural project as the um, West Calhoun Cultural District gives you, right? So we are this major um, enterprise of museum that has a presence internationally and locally at the same time. So we are very heavily linked to the International Council of Museums through the International Council for Museums of Modern Art, CIMAM, of which actually our museum director is the president at the moment. So we are very, very embedded into the discussions. Um, CIMAM actually worked on a toolkit for sustainability for museums uh, that gave at least um, a number of direct examples of how can you do quick wins mm -hmm. and how can you look into what we've been discussing on reducing 
your shipping, elongated your exhibitions, and how do you care for your collections? So there's a lot of multiple avenues there that we have been contributing to, uh, having to do also with, for example, virtual couriering. Museums actually do send people to accompany works when they travel, uh, which is, you know, again, for preservation purposes and safety, security. But, you know, um, I think COVID uh, in all its... Um, Drama also brought some good things, and we uh, were all forced to actually go into the career in virtually. Um, so CIMAM also um, is working towards that going a bit further and ensuring that that is a first option. So we've been very big players discussing um, that, those topics. We are also a member of the Gallery Climate Coalition that Francis mentioned before, which is wider than the museum sector. It's actually the whole cultural sector, including galleries and auction houses and all types of practitioners, even artists. Um, and there is a very big resource there that uh, we all contribute to, to actually amplify the impact that we have. And it's not only based on kind of more practical activities, as we are describing, but also reaching out to your audiences. And what's the best way to share these, these um, examples and these ideas with them, how to get them to think about sustainability in a different way, because museums have a very strong educational power uh, people look up as, as we are trustworthy, as I was saying before, you know, and uh, we can generate the discussion and allow for that to happen. Um, and ultimately, we've also been part of um, a big initiative uh, with the BISO uh, group, which is a group of uh, museum directors uh, from all over the world that actually generate policy uh, for um, activities within museums. And they issued a few years ago a green protocol that was talking about all these topics we're putting on the table at the moment, but also very focused on conservation, scientific base, uh, preservation of artworks, and how to... Uh, improve our efficiency around it. And we have just been part of the refreshing of that green protocol uh, with about 54 other museum professionals from around the world, uh, which are looking towards providing the examples to other museums to understand that it is safe to look into your environmental conditions a bit more broadly, and that it is perfectly fine to think about virtual couriering and the persistence before you decide to send a person, uh, and that you have to look into how safe it can be to do sea freight, although sometimes for timing or for conditions of the piece is not possible. So the whole sector is moving towards thinking before they act uh, and implementing all these uh, different practices to make us much more efficient while it's still being, you know, honoring our mandate to maintain the collections uh, for the future of our communities, uh, which is the key mandate we have. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Um, Betty, in your passionate sharing, you shared many examples um, of projects current, present, and future. So in that selection, do you, are there any specific examples that you feel best fits the blueprint of your sustainability goals and the way you see it, the direction it's heading? Um, interestingly enough, I would like to point out a project that we did not do at the end of my presentation, uh, how to not demolish a building. Uh, I think that's a really interesting principle to, to look into. Uh, of course, uh, as Sarah also earlier mentioned that as architects, right now the hot topic and the hot desire is always how do we reuse? Um, that is actually something extremely difficult to do, no matter in terms of its economics, uh, the technology, uh, the sentiments of the push and pull between the environmental, economy, and social. It is really, really strong uh, to make these projects very difficult. Uh, so um, I would say m my personal uh, advocation will be for Hong Kong to really take deeper look into the reusability of buildings, um, not necessarily just as an ex extension or an addition, but literally how do you build better so then these buildings are flexible enough to adapt to changes, for example, from offices to residential or the other way around. Thank you. Um, Finally, kind of as we, we wrap up the, this, this session, we, you know, you're all great leaders in your respective fields. Um, what inspires you to adhere to these sustainable principles? And I know we've talked about it a lot, um, but I think probably more, more importantly, what is the best way you feel you can disseminate these new ways of thinking and new modes of working, whether it's to your teams, whether it's in your business, and especially with Veronica, maybe even in your choice of artists that you choose to exhibit, um, or the choice of artists that we choose to have in, in, in our sale rooms? Um, who'd like to take the question first? 
Um, I think you have to make it a recurring discussion. It, it can't just be a one-off, obviously. <laughs> and as I was saying earlier, you get what you measure. I strongly believe in it. So you have to continue to measure, make sure you have the right data to see what impact what you actually do is, uh, is having. And um, that's how you get the commitment. I think that's, that's the, the role of uh, people in any leadership position, um, whether they are senior or more junior ones, they just have to embrace it. And I said, we're all a custodian of something. Uh, we're all a custodian of um, you know, the environment. Uh, and I think it's very important just to leave according to, to this. In, the, in any leadership position, you're not just a custodian of a PNL and a balance sheet, you're ultimately a custodian of a much bigger thing. So just to answer the first part of your question about how do you inspire or maintain yourself inspired, I think from our perspective, being pragmatic um, helps and also reflecting upon achievements is really important. So when we started our sustainability steering group within M+, uh, one of the first things were like, what are we, we going to do? What are we going to do? You know, everyone was like, yes, yes, what's next? How are we going to achieve things? And, uh, and my first thing to them was like, why well, don't we look back and see what we have already done? Um, and they were like, oh, we don't, we don't do that much. Um, and as soon as we started digging, we actually realized that we were doing lots already. And that's a way to inspire, because it means that it's already naturally happening. And now you understand that, you can keep moving, right? Now you know what the next goal can be is much bigger. So that's on the first side of things. Then, obviously, as you're saying, maintaining the conversation current. We have regular meetings of a sustainability steering group within M+, but also the sustainability task force within the district. So it's a continuous conversation. We are doing coffee talks now, so people can come in and here to talk about the topic on a more um, you know, relaxed environment. Uh, multiple activities happening. We put it on an all the staff meeting. It's a standing point on the agenda. Every all the staff meeting, there's a point on sustainability where someone comes in and shares, no matter how small thing they've achieved. So it's a way of keeping it there, right? And then as you're saying, with regards to content being a public institution that can help educate and disseminate, um, our curatorial team actually um, defined four areas of um, study and research as soon as we opened, you know? So um, digital culture, obviously, because we are 21st century museum, uh, networks of the South, uh, non-mainstream, and then ecology. Um, so these teams of multidisciplinary curators actually have a focus on research on all these areas. And the outcome of that is that we produce exhibitions and programs that bring that to the forefront, as you've seen with the Prada frames, with the carbon, a beyond carbon with Hong Kong um, Ballet. But we're also now having two forthcoming exhibitions this year, one of them called San Shui, around landscape and humanity, so, you know, linking us with nature, uh, and the other one called Making It Matters, which is reflecting upon consumption and production and what that takes to the world. So indeed, we have it embedded within, and we make sure that our programming actually reflects that commitment, and we reach to audience uh, with the knowledge. Thank you. And Betty. I think I've spoken enough. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess one key message uh, is definitely about uh, working with similar-minded people. Uh, no matter is our own team. Uh, the experts that consult us, uh, and also uh, clients. Uh, to only together with this idea of understanding, we need to balance, well, the three pillars, but at the same time, it's about balancing the quantitative and the qualitative. Uh, that's really what I think is the way to move forward, uh, to really work and try to help uh, in the evolution of, of sustainability, so-called, yeah. Thank you. And on that, I'd like to um, thank Francis, Veronica, and Betty for your great insights and sharings. Thank you very much for, for joining us this morning. So we now get together for a group picture.
and to close. Um, to close this morning's Art and Sustainability Summit, I will now put on my Christie's Education hat um, and speak to you from my position here at Christie's Education. Um, we are so incredibly honored to have hosted this Art and Sustainability Forum at Christie's and to contribute to this urgent and global conversation on climate change. Along with all the ESG conferences, sustainability conversations, and climate summits held internationally, uh, Christie's as a leader in the global art industry hopes to bring some new perspectives to these discussions to our industry and beyond. Through our understanding this morning in architecture, landscape planning, in the art business, education, and public institutions, we've had enlightening conversations from aesthetics to pragmatics, from business considerations, emissions, IT, to the community as well as the future. From artists that create monumental landscape paintings reminding us on climate change, artists who use work from recycled materials, to land artists interacting with their environment. Here at Christie's, we also are thinking of ways to transport, exhibit, and extend the lifespan of these works to exhibit its beauty and also be aware of our choices in the most sustainable of ways. Throughout the course of preparing for this forum, meeting and speaking with all the speakers and hearing the great conversations, we see how important it is for these discussions to happen, not just in silo within our own industries, but beyond ourselves, for our communities, for the future, in creating sustainable ways of working, and of course, working in our, in our respective businesses where we have the power to shift the narrative, to inspire our audience, and also move the, move the needle. Um, I am incredibly proud here at Chrissy's Education that we are allowed to present so many different educational programs to connect both with culture, history, technology, sustainability, and beyond. So thank you again to all our fantastic speakers. The many facets and roles you've played are all building blocks towards the fabric of our community and towards working to make a change for the better, for the future, and for our future generations. Thank you, everyone, for joining this morning. Um, please, please do stay on as Christie's auction previews do continue outside here. Um, please stay here in Hong Kong. And those who are joining us online, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to look forward to welcoming you to more conversations on this important topic in the future. Thank you very much.